This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 791, recorded on August 6th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent, and everybody else. Looking out my window again, as I said last time, this is um, Georgia O'Keeffe-like sky. If anyone's familiar with her later paintings, she painted a lot of cloud pictures in Santa Fe and then that general area. But it's a lot warmer today than it was last week. Uh, there's a higher level of humidity. It's uncomfortable outside. So I'm uh, ensconced in my house, and I'm, I'm feeling very good about that. Yeah, it's a nice day. Cloudy skies. It's 31C. It's it's warmer. I'm happy. The sunny days make me happier than the cloudy oh, days. It's been cloudy good, all good. week up until today. Also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brian Barker. Hi. Great to be here. Um, similar weather, unsurprisingly. Um, very wow. sunny. Uh, 90 Fahrenheit, um, which 90. is 32 Celsius. Um, and Ooh. we're in for a very warm weekend. So much for heat bubbles over cities. Yeah. <laughs> also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And uh, not surprisingly, it's pretty similar here. 87 Fahrenheit, 31C, and uh, it's broken up to partly cloudy now. But um, yeah, it's summer. Real summer right. weather. Alan, did, the, did you match the curtain to the to the phage or, or vice versa? I um, So I looked at a few different possibilities for curtain color. And when I was about to make these and I just... Um, brought fabric swatches home and showed them to Laura, who's my, you know, designated consultant on all these things. And, <laughs> and she said, Oh, that one. So but that you, was you didn't have the, the pillow at the time, did you? I, yeah, I had the pillow already. Okay. Good. Um, Your cat looks like it's being invaded. She, that's, yes. That's, that's, that's my cat. <laughs> <fage back. laughs> and from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi everybody. Rich. We have uh 89 degrees. Partly oh. sunny. There's been some rain recently within the last couple of days. Uh, it's uh, once again, a, uh, from my experience at least, a relatively mild Austin uh, summer. I don't see out 10 days, uh, temperatures forecast above 95. And I also have to report that uh, the COVID situation here in terms of the seven-day running average of hospitalizations in the five-county metropolitan statistical area continues to increase straight up. Wow. Yep. Okay. Into the red zone. We're now almost at the level where we peaked out in the uh, in July of 2020, still shy of the um, last uh surge. So uh, just based on the statistics that I'm looking at so far, we are in very deep doo-doo. Rich, how is your governor actually managing to avoid catching this? You know, I visited the governor's, man uh, governor's man uh, mansion yesterday. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. Harper, my granddaughter, wanted to go on a tour. With and or so, without a mask? <laughs> uh, we all wore masks. <laughs> of course. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, he's probably, yeah, well, he's probably he's, vaccinated. He's cruising for a bruising. I don't know. I don't know if he's vaccinated or uh, not, you, but I'll, I'll bet be. he is. He might be. Uh, and uh, yeah, I have to say right. the security at the governor's mansion was impressive. Okay. <laughs> so it could be that those guys scare off the virus. <laughs> <laughs> That's possible too. <laughs> I, well, the security at the governor's mansion in Texas would have to be impressive because everybody's walking around armed. Exactly. <laughs> it's, that's, they can carry except, open weapons. Except they Rich, can, I guess, right? Right. Uh, I, was, I was unarmed. <laughs> Should walk around with an Eppendorf. I was armed only with a credit card. <laughs> <laughs> that is powerful. Right. <laughs> Very powerful. All right. We have a couple of PSAs. Rich, can you tell us about the town halls? Right. Uh, to remind everybody, we the American Society for Virology uh, has an ongoing effort uh, towards vaccine education consisting of Zoom mediated what we call town hall meetings where two experts out of a pool of 50 will meet with whoever signs up and uh, address your vaccine questions as accurately as they possibly can. So if you go to uh, asv.org slash education, you can sign up for one of these. Uh, there are currently, by the time this drops, uh, 
Uh, the first, the next uh, town hall is August 9th. There's one on the 9th, the 10th, the 12th, and the 19th. And I'm sure that there will be more uh, going on out. So if you or anybody uh, you know wants to hear the truth from the experts, uh, please uh, sign up. Rich, you're getting a lot of pushback from people because of the the temporal conflicting reports from CDC, let's say from three months ago to today. They say, but but they already told us not to, you know, those sort of um, things. I, uh, uh, I have not done a town hall for a while, so okay. I have not seen this. I've encountered it in the media. And yeah. uh, during my pick today, we can address this very topic. Absolutely. Okay. Randy Coors. Randy Coors, uh, the uh, best way, this is a, a farewell, a rest in peace to Randy Coors. And I think the best way to do this is to, re to read this uh, brief obituary that was uh, uh, compiled by some faculty in his department of uh, neurology at um, University of Colorado School of Medicine. We are deeply saddened by the sudden passing of Professor Randall J. Coors, PhD, MS, on Friday, July 30th. Randy joined the Department of Neurology as an instructor in 1989. For more than 25 years, his laboratory has studied the molecular virology of varicella zoster virus. Dr. Coors was an integral part of uh, Professor Don Gilden's team in demonstrating that VSV was latent in human ganglia. He was the first to identify the VSV transcripts of CCV. I'm sorry, VZV. Uh, that's varicella zoster virus. Uh, alias chickenpox, alias shingles, transcripts associated with latent infection, and was a key contributor in the recent identification of a novel VZV latency associated transcript. He further led the field in characterizing epigenetic alterations of the VZV genome. His contribution to research is evident in his 160 published papers, reviews, and book chapters. Over the decades, Dr. Coors mentored numerous postdoctorates and took special delight in mentoring scores of undergraduates, inviting them to explore the STEM world. He served as a veritable conduit of scientific knowledges, knowledge, fostering and encouraging collaborations around the globe. For many years, he orchestrated the Colorado Alpha Herpes Virus Latency Society Conference with his legendary fireside chats. He was president of the Rocky Mountain Virology Association, grooming it to become a premier uh, meeting of regional virologists enhanced by the attendance of world-class invited lecturers. Randy was unfailingly generous, kind, and always had a wonderful story and never knew a stranger. His loss to our group is immeasurable and his contributions to translational research long lasting. Uh, I've known Randy since the mid 1980s where we collaborated on a uh, small project and uh, I actually attended uh, at his invitation one of the uh, Rocky Mountain Virology Conferences and I've uh, interacted with Randy over the years. Uh, he, uh, Randy, <laughs> looks like Santa Claus. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> actually, I think actually, uh, served as a Santa Claus. Okay. Uh, uh, in, in the season. And I woke up thinking about him the other day and I decided, you know, maybe Randy was Santa Claus <laughs> uh, because that's Randy larger than life. Okay. Uh, you could not be uh, in his presence and not feel a little better about what was going on. Dixon, you could be Santa Claus too. Are you muted? You're, You're muted. muted. Don't I don't have the temperament for that. I think <laughs> rather receive than give. <laughs> so Randy will be missed. He uh, left us. Uh, he left us too early. And yeah. so farewell, Randy. Um, yeah, I think, uh, all good people leave too early. I think Don Gilden uh, passed a few years ago, right? Uh. uh Maybe so. Yeah, I'm not he did. Aware of that. I know Don because uh, he, he and Saul Silverstein uh, knew each other, and um, he he did pass a number of years ago. Colorado. Let's see if we can pick it up. Don Gilden, MD. Yeah. Oh, this was uh, August 2016, and uh, Ten Tyler wrote his obituary. Yeah, 79. Yeah, it's not bad, right? 
I, I don't know if anyone knows. I don't know. <laughs> you got Dixon, to look like Dixon <laughs> is questioning that one. <laughs> 79 is not. Uh, that's well, not Dixon, you <laughs> passed it already. That's good. Yeah, that's uh, that's right. I'm walking on thin ice. <laughs> <laughs> Could be no. any minute, right, Dixon? Any, no, no, let's not go there. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know if anyone knew Kathy Squires. She was a microbiologist. Yeah. She died this yeah. week also. Oh, is that right? She was a microbiologist first here at Columbia. Then she became chair of micro at Tufts. And How long ago was she at Columbia, Vincent? Whoa, quite a while ago. Oh, wow. I mean, when I came, she was still, she was down at Morningside. Oh, okay? Morningside. And oh, then yeah. left to go to Tufts. Right. She took Elio Schechter's job, I think, because he left uh, chair and she took it. And then she, I think he said she retired 10 years ago. She was a bacterial molecular biologist. Yeah. Right. Yes, I knew her from the uh, transcription meetings that ah. uh, used to happen in Mountain Lake. Wow. Right. And I took a little trip today. Let's see if I can find, where the hell is this thing? Doesn't this work to share a an app? <sighs> I have this app and it's, it's usually you can share... Uh, an app. Uh, all right, let's try this Por portion of screen. I don't know. Can you see? Yeah, there it That's, is. Yeah. You're a little zoomed in. Yeah, yeah you're a little zoomed in. We got your eye. On How's the, that? Is that better? There we go. There Much we go. better. All right. So there's this thing in Zoom where you could select the, the part of the screen you want to look at. That's, that's oh. what I did. Anyway, I visited the incubator today and I put up a temporary sign so that deliveries would get there. So there it is. The incubator. Cool. So our studio, our new studio. And then cool. uh, I brought the owner came by and he said, Oh, I'll get you a proper sign. <laughs> it was okay. I thought this Excellent. was pretty proper, but he wants a standard <laughs> sign that's on every door. Anyway, very excited. Furniture started to come in. And um, uh, next week, I should have a desk so I could actually start going there and doing things. I bought a rise desk, you know, where you can stand up. Mm -hmm. oh. Which is good because I don't have any chairs yet, so <laughs> I can just stand <laughs> at it. And uh, I've got uh, some. I, I, I'm hiring people to do some sound uh, dampening treatment, con treatment right. consultation to do that, and a few. So slowly but surely, um, it's coming. Uh, coming to it's cool. It's fun because I get out of Penn Station and it's two blocks. I go right yeah. there. What's yeah. the target for opening? I mean, the, some of the furniture is not going to be in until September, right? Ah, okay. I would like to be able to go and record there like this, you know. I mean, you're going to have a blank wall for a while, but um, I just need to get some lights in. And maybe in uh, by September I can do that. We'll see. Cool. You need to get a cat. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Cats yeah. of Twiv but are going to be leave it. I, I can't leave it there uh, all night, right? No, no. That wouldn't be good. Anyway, it's very exciting. Looking forward to that. All right. So today we have a nano snippet and two papers. And the papers have a theme, which is cool. And the nano snippet, it's a bioarchive re preprint. And I don't know if you remember Monica Trujillo, who is uh, here at Queens College or Queensborough College. I don't remember which one, but she did. She was on for the uh, wastewater of New York City screening for SARS-CoV-2. Right. 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 I think that was Queensborough. Queensboro. So she sent me a, actually a little uh, PDF from the uh, USDA about this a couple of weeks ago. And now they made a bioarchive print. SARS-CoV-2 exposure in wild white-tailed deer. Um, this and of course, the usual footnotes on a on a preprint. It's nobody's reviewed this. It's just yep. up there. And I figured this, it is open access. This was so simple that we could. It was it's straightforward. It. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is from the USDA, which is from Fort Collins in Ames, Iowa. And the first author is Jeff Chandler, and the last author is Susan Schreiner. And apparently some time ago, an actual experimental infection in white-tailed deer was done, which showed they could be infected. They shed virus. They can transmit virus to contact deer. Wow. I wonder where they did that, because deer are big. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So those are in the lab, obviously. So here they wanted to say, see, do wild deer... Get infected. And I have lots of deer around our house. Um, the infected deer showed subclinical infection. Okay, yeah. So I guess they didn't have much by way of symptoms, if anything. Yeah. So uh, from January to March of this year, they got 385 serum samples from these deer from four states, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Illinois, and New York. 
They also have an archive of samples, so they tapped into that. 239 serum samples from 2011 to 2020. And these are these are just part of routine surveillance that USDA does for animal diseases, and they, and they've been tracking this for years for a variety of things. Most recently, chronic wasting disease, which we've talked about. Yeah. So lime. They and did, lime is yeah. another. Big one. <laughs> they did neutralization assays. They did not only surrogate right using a pseudotype virus, but they also did authentic SARS-CoV-2 neutralization tests. Good for you. Yeah. Um, because, uh, you know, they have a, I guess Ames has the BSL-3, yeah. They found antibodies in 40% of the 2021 samples, three samples from 2020 and one from 2019, nothing from 2011 to 2018. <laughs> okay. This figure one that charts that is uh, stunning. Yes. Figure one. Yeah, it's quite nice. Yeah, the, the archive mm -hmm. of samples was critical for this. Yeah. You know, you got to have this over a period of years because if you only showed up and started collecting them after the pandemic started, well, what does that actually mean? If yeah. We don't know. But the background levels for all the way back to uh, several previous years. Wow. Just, no, yeah. It really says a lot about peri-domestic behavior, doesn't it? Well, that's the question, Dixon. Where where did these deer get, how did these deer get infected, Dixon? Yeah, what do you, you think? Must, you have to involve some authentic cases of people. They got it from cats. Uh, <laughs> Maybe. Uh, I was assuming they got it from something like mice. Yeah, probably yeah. mice, right? Or, or mm. some sort of uh, ferret-like creature. Is that weasels. a possibility? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Weasels. weasels. Because mink get it, right? Yeah. They do. They do. Yeah, it, so many things can apparently catch and, as far as we can tell, carry this virus. Um, yeah. but, but there is also a lot of human contact with deer. Mm -hmm. yeah, and including yeah, there at, is there is including at, at shockingly short ranges that don't involve the death of the deer um you know where people they put up okay so disclaimer do not do this but a lot of people will put a big feeder of corn in their backyard because they Absolutely. want to see deer yeah. Yeah, yeah and they'll you know they'll go out there and they'll refill it constantly because the deer yeah, yeah, will come yeah. there and chow down on the corn which is terrible for them it's horrible for the deer digestive exactly. tract but they can't it's like doritos they can't stop eating it <laughs> um well my neighbor so, puts a salt lick out is that okay yeah that's yeah Mm. It's not okay. I mean, no. it's it's not bad for no, the deer. It just attracts at least, deer to the human it habitat. Just, it attracts well, look, the deer to the human. We have deer <coughs> anyway, even if you don't yeah. put it because there's vegetation everywhere. Right. I just so wish it, they would eat the pack of Sandra. They don't seem to like that. <laughs> it, it raises <laughs> raises another question though, and that is that they did a lot of animal surveys in China and they didn't find the virus in deer. Did they look in deer? In anything. In anything. That's well, weird. They, they found, we talked about that paper a couple of weeks ago where they talked about the animals present in the market. Yeah. Um, and so, and, you know. I don't they think were looking In that paper, they, they were, were looking for they, virus. They were looking for antibodies. Right. Oh, that's and true. They were, and they were looking at a different time period. Yeah, so there's a true. lot right. of work that's true. that, you know, like archival samples right around the time of the spillover. Right. And what do we find in animals? And we're not finding anything because it hasn't made it into humans. Exactly. And humans carry it everywhere and give it to everything else. And so in this paper, you're seeing uh, areas, you know, 2021, all these states are full of SARS-CoV-2. And so it's right. getting into, apparently, getting into wild animals if we're to believe that these antibodies are actually generated yeah. that way. Yeah. Well, it would be fascinating to actually get the, uh, get your hands on uh, some of the virus yeah, that is doing deer. this and yeah. see yes. what the sequence is. That's right, that's right, that's right. Uh, so they, the seroprevalence varied by state. The highest was Michigan, 67%, and intermediate in New York and Pennsylvania. They, that's they, huge. They also say that this early these early positives are – probably some cross reactive. I mean, we don't know, right, if this is specific or not. And there are, there's the sampling here, it's a lot of it is a sample of opportunity. Um, so they've got one one year, I think it might have been 2020, where there was a huge number of samples, like 20 samples were taken from one location in October. Ah, yeah. And I'm thinking there's probably a game check station Absolutely. because that's deer season and that's, that's right what, that would be real easy to get that's samples correct. of deer blood it's all over You're the right. place Absolutely right. um hmm. so these are they're wild animals and you sample where you can yep they say many human activities could bring deer into contact 
captive surveyed operations, field research, conservation work, wildlife That's tourism. another issue, farm-raised venison. Wildlife yeah, yeah, yeah. rehabilitation, supplemental feeding, hunting. I'll tell you, my land, if I don't, they don't get near me. As soon as they see me, they, <laughs> right. they stay quite far away. So they're always more than six feet from me. So they didn't get it from me. They didn't get it from me. <laughs> right. Well, they know you're a virologist, you know, and you can. <laughs> but the, the deer farming, deer farming, it, that hadn't occurred to me, but that's a very good point. There are millions of deer that are raised in semi-domesticated right. settings that's and right. people are in contact with them constantly and they exactly. escape. So. So There's it, easy uh, it would, I think, it would be very interesting to do more extensive surveys and see how, yes. ex, how, you know, how much across the U.S., maybe the rest of the world too, and sure. other animals too. I'd love to see other animals. Um, right. I guess deer are easy to to sample, right? Yeah. Well, this takes yeah. us back to one of the very first episodes where uh, we talked with uh, Ralph Barrick about spillback. Yeah. Yep. And the potential for uh, having a continuing reservoir of this virus uh, in s some other creature. Uh, not that that's gonna be necessary. This is gonna be with humans. It'll forever. be with us yeah, forever. Yeah. Yeah. Other creature. So, so I saw one other comment on this um, when I was looking at, when I was following some of this online um, and it struck me as, no, of course that's not possible. Um, but then I realized that someone who doesn't spend a lot of time thinking about viruses would not necessarily know <laughs> that it was not possible. Um, and so I saw some speculation about, well, what about ticks? Mm -hmm. um, because there are some people who think about um, other microbes sure. um, mm -hmm. in ticks um, and sort of that relationship with deer. Um, and so I would not expect ticks to be infected here. Um, you have to, microbes have to have kind of some special properties to be able to reproduce in arthropods as well as in humans. And we don't see that in any coronaviruses. There are right. pathogens that can do it. Um, but it takes some special tricks and we don't know that coronaviruses can. So I'm not worried about this becoming something that is spread by ticks. I am still worried about ticks. Yes. That's because of everything <laughs> else they carry. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. Agree. But I suspect that many, many deer are infected. In addition to rodents, most likely, I think at some point we'll hear from Tony Shouts. Remember, he said he was going to do some mm -hmm. sampling. Right. And I am sure many other, I, bet, I mean, pff, squirrels. Yeah. Ferrets live in the wild, right? Sure. Uh, well, yeah, weasels, and they're, they do. their native habitat, which is not North America, but there are lots of weasels in North America. So the right? native habitat of a ferret is not the laboratory, Alan? No, right. That's right. They live in influenza labs. Um, but this, this raises a complication in all these efforts to find the viral origin, right? Because now the virus is everywhere there are people, and you're going to go into the woods in various parts of Asia looking for the source and what are you going to find? Well, I think you can do phylogenomics to, you can, to you're trace gonna, it, it's, right? It's going to be critical to do that. Yes. Yeah. You can say, well, this didn't come from this or that or whatever. I Although think, yeah. that could get messy when you've got a spillback event and the virus then adapts to a new host species, sure. right? Yeah, sure. But hopefully you'd be able yeah. to see trace. I mean, the real interesting question is if which we raised a while ago is if it has gone back into bats that don't normally harbor yes. corona right. these right in different countries mm -hmm. besides where where the SARS-CoV-2 like coronaviruses are in bats so harder to answer right cuz harder to trap a bat but yeah, yeah. kind of be interesting to know either way yep if it did go in or if it didn't what kept it from going what stopped in? it yeah yes mm. yes a lot of interesting things so there you go Odocoileus virginianus is the white-tailed deer. Dixon, any insight about white-tailed deer you could share with us before we leave the subject? No, We've got too damn they, many of them. They're, that, well, that's <laughs> exactly. I mean, there's a big problem out on Long Island. The, the further out on Long Island you go, the more numerous the deer become. And, uh, of course, along with that, of course, is the Lyme disease epidemic. They're a big problem in every suburban yep. ex-urban yep. area all yeah. across we have the tons, US. We have tons of them. Yeah. I don't mind yeah. them actually. They're yeah. fine. On a, on a college campus that's called the forest, um, you yeah. find a few. Yeah. I, I don't clear. mind them. I think they're interesting and I, I get up in the morning. They're always outside. Sometimes they're sleeping right next to the house. Every year they have 
babies, one or two, right? And this, they eat the flowers. This morning I, sh I saw a young male <laughs> with brand new horns coming out, running around, you oh, know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, I, and by the way, that's why your auto insurance bills are so high. Because <laughs> the reason. deer, the accidents a with a accidents, deer yeah. in New Jersey is incredibly high. But whatever you do, if you're about to hit one, don't swerve. Don't veer for deer. Why is that? Just hit it. Just hit the just, brakes and just hit it. Because if, you, if you're if you at high speed and you make a sudden veer, you're likely to roll over. Much worse point, crash than point, hitting point. head on where your engine is protecting right. you. So that's my point. little public service Yeah, message. the deer may mm. ruin your car, but yes. <laughs> yeah. Cars can be replaced. Well, they could um, go through the front they, windshield and ruin both they driver can, and can, but you're much better protected hitting something head on than rolling over the vehicle. I, I hear that. I and hear they that. can swim also. Uh, deer yes, swim. Oh, yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. So years ago, I used to go out to Plum Island. There's a laboratory there to do yes. some work. And so it's, it's an island. So you have to take a ferry to it. And... Even on the island, they have a lot of containment. And I said once, why Why do you do this? He said, well, <laughs> we have seen deer swimming from the mainland to Plum exactly. Island, just their exactly. head above the water. And they yes, can right. get onto Plum Island. And if there's anything out, they might bring it back. Right. So we have to be right. I said, oh my gosh, can you imagine seeing a deer yeah, yeah. <laughs> with his head above the water? So uh, the, the one uh, thing I can say, though, is that the, if you go out west, deer are the primary food for mountain lions. And they eat five a week. Yeah. And they don't eat anything but the livers. <laughs> they run them down, they kill them, they eat the liver, and they leave the rest that's, of the See, carcass. That's what I wanted from you, Dixon, that kind of there a gem. Now, uh, what, well, do they have any natural predators here in the Northeast? They used to. They used to. Well, they, mountain lions and wolves. <laughs> they, and wolves, um, mountain lions and wolves. But we bears, eradicated those. And that's, bears. that's why we're overpopulated with deer. That's right. Because Black we took bears out their natural predators. A, we'll eat a, uh, a fawn, but they can't catch the adults. But we we have these northeastern coyotes now. Maybe they could they eat them. do. They can occasionally take down a fawn, but they're yeah, not they making rather, any dent in the deer they'd population. They'd rather eat dogs the, and cats. Okay. The deer reproduction is just, it's it's tuned control, evolutionarily to be control. preyed on constantly by wolves and cougars. And so right. we took those away and now we we're full of deer. So a fox Correct. could not take down a deer, no, right? No, no, oh, good no. Because mm -hmm. we stuff. have lots of foxes, yeah. Okay. Oh. I like that. I like to learn about a wildlife. A human with a shotgun can take down Yeah, I was going to say, my, I, I had to hold myself <laughs> back from saying the predator of the deer was my dad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he likes to go deer hunting? Yes. Have you eaten deer, Brianne? I have. Very good. It's, it's yeah. very Medicine tasty. Medicine is excellent. Mm. My stepfather was a, an avid hunter. Yeah. All right. Now let's move on to T cells. I, I have two papers, which. <laughs> just a, a minor shift. Hooray! No need for a segue. Well, deer do have T cells, by the way. Deer right? have T cells, yes. <laughs> um, these two papers are, present a different view of uh, the role of T cells in COVID 19. And. Um, the, the, one of them has gotten a lot of attention lately, so I thought we would talk about them and try and discuss what's the story here. So the first is uh, published in Nature Rapid. I guess it's a pre-publication, whatever you call that thing. Accelerated article preview uh, is, is tattooed all over the thing, so I can't highlight any text. I it took is it a peer-reviewed paper that has been accepted for publication. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yes, but, but not yet edited. So, right. Alan, I have Acrobat, and I can go through and take off all those tattoos, ah. and then I can highlight it. I learned that that was possible. That's the solution. Okay. It might, it might if, work with Reader, Acrobat Reader, which is the free version, right? Yeah, I don't know if... Um, and it's a little tricky because you have to select the boxes that have right. just that, that uh, angular text, but it works. Rapid and stable mobilization of CD8 positive T cells by SARS-CoV-2 mRNA vaccine. Uh, this is from a number of groups, looks like mainly in uh, Freiburg. Germany, Freiburg, sure. right? Yeah. And the, uh, let's see, do we have, yes, jointly, uh, we have Valerie Oberhardt, Hendrik Luxemburger, Janine Kemming, and Isabel Schulian, co-first authors, and then Robert Thimme and Christoph Neumann, Neumann Heffelin and Micah Hoffman were co supervisors of this work. Um, and so what caught my eye about this was that they note in the in the vaccine trials of mRNA vaccines, the onset of mRNA, mRNA media protection 
was observed as early as 10 to 12 days after the first dose, but there was no neutralizing antibody detectable at that time. They, dun, dun, dun. They only Who appear, was taking out the virus? They <laughs> only appear after the first boost. I mean, you have antibodies, but they don't neutralize. Right. Although maybe as we learned on immune, they could do, they could block infection by another method, right? Ah, even more nuanced. Exactly. <laughs> anyway, they uh, suggest in this paper, maybe it's the T cells that are, because you can find, as you will see in this paper, you can find T cells at that early time when you're getting protection. They say these observations point towards a key role of vaccine-induced T cells. Now, I have to say at this early stage, there is a, a guy on Twitter. I'm not going to mention his name. He's a cardiologist from LA. Okay. And he keeps saying, this sh the, the other paper, oh, this shows that the narrative about T cells is wrong. Oh my God, it just drives me nuts. A cardiologist telling you that T cell narrative is wrong. Anyway, <laughs> that's why I wanted to do these two papers. So in this study, they do, they follow people after vaccination periodically f before the first shot uh, until the second shot and then afterwards. And they look at CD8 and CD4 T cells and antibody. So it's a cool study. So they have, uh, they collect peripheral blood mononuclear cells from 32 healthcare workers, three to four days apart. They never were infected before their first, their prime inoculation. And then after the boost for up to 120 days. Okay, it's a good study. And then they say, first, what about the spike-specific CD8-positive T cells? And I guess they, they have some peptides, right, Brianne, which they can yes. use. They take these cells from the blood and they throw in peptide and they see if they get activated, basically, right? Is that the essence? Um, so they talk a little bit about how this compares to previous uh, work. And in previous work, they had used pools of peptides. Yeah. Um, so here they've actually figured out the specific peptides and the specific HLA types yeah. that they are looking at. Um, sometimes they will use, um, some peptide stimulation, but more frequently what they do is they, um, try to measure just those specific cells using tetramers. Okay. Um, so they use, a uh, special reagent that you can use in full cytometry to measure the antigen specific CD8 positive T cells. And the tetramer uses the peptide. The tetramer uses the peptide yeah. and MHC. It's okay. four Got copies, unsurprisingly, of peptide and MHC. Got it. And and this starts to get at the major reason that we don't hear more about T cells. It's hard. They're a pain to analyze. Yeah, absolutely. Right. <laughs> They're hard. And, and antibodies, and I mean, you got a bazillion assays for antibodies, but T cells, yeah, this, right. is, this so, is some work. So they needed to know exactly which peptide bound to which HLA molecule and they needed to know which HLA molecule each of their donors had so that they could test for that specific right. peptide. Um, and so doing that genetic mm -hmm. work and doing that sort of immunology work um, takes a while. Especially if yep. you're going for a nature paper. Yeah. yeah. All right, so, right. And these, these, these peptides that they use were not conserved with SARS-CoV-1 and MERS. So it's not likely that these people would have previous uh, T cell responses if they happen mm -hmm. to be infected with those viruses. So anyway, they see an induction of spike-specific CD8 T cells um, in nine of the 13 donors at six to eight days after the prime and in not, and most donors nine to 12 days after, just after the prime, before the boost. And by the way, these epitopes that they pick, these peptides are not affected by any spike changes in the variants of concern, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. Okay. And so, uh, Vince, the, yes, sir. I'm sorry, Vince, to interrupt, did you just say which vaccines they have received? Yeah, it's the MR, it's an mRNA vaccine. Right? Yeah, it's which the, one though? Pfizer, Pfizer. 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 Yeah. Pfizer. Only? Yeah, just I one. Yes, so. all okay. of these, I think okay. all these subjects are the, that vaccine. Very well, thank you. Pfizer. Nobody laughed. I guess it's too old a joke. Uh, the boost gives you a further increase in T cell frequencies, peaks five to six days post boost. Okay. So those are, so Brian, those are effector CD8 T cells, would you say? Um, so they call them effector C8 T cells, particularly because of some of the full cytometry markers that they yeah. see on them. Yeah. Um, and so those are, you know, really the effector cells that are going to be 
killing virus. Yes, killing virus infected cells, right? Yeah. Okay, mm-hmm. good. Uh, they also look at T, T, CD8 memory T cells, which have different markers on their surfaces, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and they do see those as well after the prime, and they see they go down, and then after the boost, they go up again. Um, so they say from this that vaccination, yes, BNT162B2, vigorously induces a lasting spike-specific CD8 T cell response rapidly after prime vaccination. And this correlates with the earliest protection, which I think is just lovely, right? Then how long did we say, what about the T cells? (laughs) Yes. Yes, I feel like I've been saying that forever. (laughs) Yes. So when a T cell kills a virus infected cell and the virus is set to be released from that cell, what happens to those virus particles? Well, it depends where they are in the reproductive cycle, right? If it's very yes, early, it does. if well, it's very early, the then that's it, that's it for the virus. If so, so coronaviruses bud in, intracellularly, right, into vesicles. Yes. So you could imagine those vesicles being released with virus in them. Um, I don't know how the virus would get out of those. <laughs> those are secretory vesicles that would need to fuse with the plasma membrane to release the virus. So it might be a problem, right? Right. So and their their life cycle imagine. depends entirely on a living cell to aid in their export. Yes. You, you could also imagine that some of those viruses um, would be in apoptotic bodies or at least virus parts yeah. um, because that infected cell would be undergoing apoptosis. So right. they would be kind of contained within an apoptotic body. And, and the other question related to that is how does the T cell know which cell to kill if the virus is at a is a early stage of development? And what, so is the, the, what is the uh, signal from the infected cell that tells it that it's infected? So that is a presentation of a viral peptide on mm. the surface of the infected cell um, on the MHC. So, so it would have could, to be, have could be any peptide. Could it could be, be any a peptide. protein made very early. <laughs> yes. Um, oh, okay. At, so earlier, middle, or late stage. Right. Yeah. So would, basically would all, all of the proteins that are made Right. Um, get degraded into peptides and then okay, displayed yeah, yeah. Got at that. MHC. Got that. So, Brianne, I'm uh, uh, wondering whether um, in this whole process where you have this train wreck of a T cell <laughs> killing an infected cell, if uh, there aren't signals set out that summon uh, other players to clean up the mess. Oh, absolutely. And right. I can imagine those being uh, present in a lot of different ways. So I will just right. say yes. Yes. <laughs> so can the same T cell kill multiple infected cells? It can. Aha. Uh-huh. Wow. What, what kind of experiment would you do to show that, Brian? <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh, you'd have to radio label I the cells, I seem to right? recall yeah. doing a paper, so, or maybe it was Janeway. Yeah, I actually have that. an... I, I can find it. Um, there no, is just... a video that I show in my class uh-huh. of this in a uh, culture dish. Um, and really? you can actually watch a cell. Going from cell to cell to cell. <laughs> uh, doing more than one killing event. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, the, the CD8 positive T cells are kind of like RoboCop. I like them. <laughs> actually, I think I've seen that video, which means it must be part of the Janeway text. <laughs> Uh, so, Jay uh, Brand, how long how, do they have to wind up again? How long after they degranulate do they <laughs> reload? <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's a good question. Um, I do not remember the answer to that. Because cool. they release lots of granules, right? They do. They release a lot of their granules. And then they probably need to make some more. But. Right. It, I guess it probably depends on whether they released all of their granules or just some of them. Okay. So remind me what those granules contain. Yeah. Uh, what, what's to. the mechanism of toxicity? <laughs> um, so the t- two most famous things they can contain are molecules called perforin, which uh, perforin. breaks holes in the membrane. Oh, it yes. perforates. Oh, yes. um, and then um, something called granzyme B, um, which actually activates the apoptosis cascade. It, okay. it cleaves um, caspase mm. three. But cool. there are a bunch of things in there. Those are just the two famous ones. And I think it tell, tells the cell to kill itself and starts the process for mm-hmm. it. So the yeah. granzyme, I think, goes through the perforin pore, right? And then it does, activates yes. apoptosis. Exactly. Yeah. What a world. It's a yeah. great world. It's amazing that it just yeah. happened. It just, anyway, so they actually measure some functional capacities um, by measuring interferon gamma and, and TNF tumor necrosis factor production. So they show that uh, some of these are functional, these T cells. All right. 
Uh, then they look at CD4. Yes, you were going to say something? Oh, yeah. I have one other thing I want to say about yep. their CD8 data, because I think that when we put these papers together, this is actually kind of important. Um, so one of the things they really talk about here in the CD8 section is the importance of CD8 effector cells mm -hmm. and effector cell generation versus memory cells. Right. So they have one section where they say, oh, we had better um, expansion of cells. They divided more. Um, but we think that's because there were more effector cells, not because they were actually better at dividing. And so this CD8 section really hits on effector CD8 cells as being the difference, not as much memory cells or other cell types. So it's really those early effector cells that are key. Mm -hmm. As you, you make sense, right? Because that's what you would need early to provide a protection that you exactly. observe in the vaccinated people, right? Memory, no. All right, then the other kind of T cells, CD4 positive T cells, they can also measure and they see, you know, they again, similar pattern, They but the, the frequencies of these CD4s are lower compared to the CD8s, but they can detect them. Um, they have a Th1 phenotype, um, um, which uh, you would expect, I guess, right, Brianne? Yes. That, and that's what you want to. That's what you want. A TH1 phenotype yeah. is going to be the more protective type in this situation. And so you, you see um, an increase. So these are, the, these are the helper T cells that fire up the rest of the immune system, the yes. antibody response. Yeah, the CD4s are the helpers that can help both make CD8s and B cells make antibody, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then they look at antibody production and they can see an increase in the, the, the frequency of B cells shortly after that, that boost uh, and a progressive maturation of the serum antibody response. They see I, spike specific IgM first after the prime and then uh, IgG after the boost. And at that time after the boost, that's when you see high neutralization uh, capacity. They actually do plaque reduction assays. Um, and, and show that the IgG that you make after the boost gives you nice neutralization. Um, and they they check alpha and beta for neutralization. Do um, we know if IgM neutralizes? I, did they, I don't think they checked IgM. At least they don't mention. They just say spike-specific IgM is present uh, after the prime. They don't actually say that it's neutralizing. Um and IgG is the one that they say is neutralizing. Right. I mean, I guess it theoretically could, but it's generally not thought of as yeah. being the exactly. main point of IgM. Exactly. But remember, in these in the vaccination, you don't see any neutralization until right. later, right? Several weeks After the later. boost, actually. So That's right. That's right. That's, that's, right. that's consistent with that. Um, so they say the spike and receptor binding domain-specific B cells are below the limit of detection until the first week after the boost. It takes a while for them to get going. Yet there's protection at 10 to 11 days, so that's cool. Right. And they also sh uh, show that their antigen-specific memory B cells induced as well. So that's that. What else is interesting here? I was, uh, I'm sitting here thinking, this just occurred to me, I'm sitting here thinking about the J&J uh, &J vaccine that mm. uses a single injection because mm -hmm. we've been over this before where we've looked at uh the antibody response and we've noted that in most of these vaccines you can see the antibody response being boosted okay and i tend to think about the one shot jj vaccine in that context and i've seen you know adenovirus vector data that says that you get an effect with a boost but this says uh this uh lends credence to the idea that you could get um good protection in just the prime. I make it sense. Antibody yeah, dependent. you are. Yeah. That may Absolutely. be more T cell dependent. Yeah. Yeah. Right. They also looked at T cells from people who recovered from infection to compare them to the vaccinated people. And they say compared to natural infection, vaccine associated spike specific early memory CD8 T cells exhibit similar functional capacities, but a different subset distribution. So I am not sufficiently sophisticated to understand this, the significance of a subset distribution. Brianne, can you shed any light? Sure. That? So um, going into uh, the perhaps this week's theme of 
immune responses have nuance. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, there are multiple different types of memory cells. And exactly how many and exactly what they do is a little bit controversial in the field. But there are more <laughs> multiple types of memory cells. There are happy memories and sad memories. Ex exactly. There are, there are memory cells that live in different places, um, all sorts of things like that. And so basically what they're saying here is that um, we're getting slightly different types of memory cells um, in these two situations. Which kind of makes sense. Yeah. I mean, the, and it's... It's reassuring yeah. in a way that that's detectable with the tools yeah. we have, right? Mm -hmm. That you got two different experiences and you ended up with two different types of immunological memory. Yeah, makes sense. Right. And, and that's sort okay. of what we would expect. And the, the infection is very different from mRNA vaccination, obviously, right? Yeah. Many, mm -hmm. many different things happening. So, okay. All right. So that that's the data. And they, they summarize. Here, let me read their summary because it's I couldn't do any better. In sum, a robust, stable, and fully functional spike-specific CD8 T-cell response is elicited already after prime vaccination at a time when neutralizing antibodies are hardly detectable, coincides with the protective effect for mRNA vaccines that starts at 10 to 12 days. Uh, in contrast, peak mobilization of neutralizing antibodies and antigen-specific B cells to the periphery were detectable after boost and this, they say, agrees with previous reports and probably represents maturation of the response in secondary lymphoid uh, organs. After boost, highly cross-neutralizing antibodies are present in the sera, clearly adding a major protective effector mechanism on top of the early mobilized CD8 T cell response. And then they say this, you know, lasts at least the CD8 response lasts at least a couple of months. How much longer we need to look because we don't know because we're not that far out. We need to make some more studies to look at that. And, and which which strain or, or variety of SARS-CoV do they Variant. direct all this to? Alpha, beta, gamma, delta? Uh, they did this with the original. They did it the with original. the original. And they also alpha. check <laughs> they check neutralization with uh, beta and Alpha and beta, I think, yeah. And they said there's a little bit of a reduction, but you still get neutralization. Yeah, the uh, the vaccine uses vintage spike. <laughs> vintage. Okay. That's right. Uh, <laughs> oh, geez. But the, yeah. uh, That's but right. The, the, the epitopes, acetate version. <laughs> the epitopes that they chose to use for the tests are conserved throughout the variants. Okay, so right. the results right. that they're seeing should apply right. across the board. Right. So when I right. read this uh, two weeks ago, I said, you know, this is in line with, remember folks, the J&J &J vaccine in South Africa, the phase three trial, the serum from the vaccinees didn't neutralize the, so what is the, is that the beta get variant down there in South Africa? I believe that's beta. Didn't neutralize, it had reduced neutralization, maybe up to tenfold, but 100% protected them against uh, hospitalization and death. And so- Right. This makes sense right. that the T cells are involved, right? Right. Speaking of vintage, I, I'll never forget when I was a graduate student, first year, I'm in the office of Jerry Schulman, who was a, an immunologist, very smart guy. And um, he, we were talking about influenza, different HA subtypes. And he asked me a question and he, he posed it by saying, which vintage was that one? <laughs> <laughs> and I laughed and he laughed too, because it was funny to put it in the yeah. context of a wine, right? Yeah. <laughs> Makes sense. What year? Absolutely. So I'm I'm realizing that from as you were reading the summary, uh, it made me think of a interesting experimental question mm -hmm. um, with this, which is that you know they talk about the B cell response happening later after boost, and I wonder if they could have if they looked in some people who had only gotten the first dose and who didn't get the second dose. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Um, is it just that it happened to be late and coincidentally was after the boost or did the boost actually induce that response? Good question. Good question. So they have antibodies uh, after the prime, but they're just not neutralizing. So the question right. is, if you didn't boost them, would they eventually have developed? Exactly. You know, probably, right. I exactly. bet they would have. Yeah. I bet they would have. Right? Maybe not as much. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that's been done in some studies where people only got one one dose, right? Right. I, I don't know if they've done it to this kind of level of detail. Yeah. Um, and I would guess that you'd probably want to do that first in an animal model because here you want people sure. getting two doses and being yes. protected. That's right. So how long lived are these 
protective T cells if you didn't boost again. I mean, oh, that's what they don't—they don't know how long the memory cells will last. Like, right? They don't. It's know only how August. Long. It's only <laughs> August. No, I meant the ones that actually killed off the the infected uh, oh. viral cells. Oh, they, those right. actual cells. How long does this yeah. does a CTL last, Brian? Um, so that's part of that whole uh, idea of different subsets. Uh -huh. um, basically, the more differentiated you are, the more effector-like you are, the shorter your lifetime is. Hmm. Oh, dear. <laughs> I thought it was the other way. You mean no. I went to graduate school for nothing? <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, so so the, the effector cells are short-lived and the memory cells are long-lived. Hmm. Right. That we knew. Makes sense. Yeah. Which fits, yeah. Yes. All right, so then I thought it would be a nice contrast to do this MBio paper, which got some attention in this past week. Uh, recovery from acute SARS-CoV-2 infection and development of anamnestic immune responses in T-cell-depleted rhesus macaques. So this is a non-human primate study from Rocky Mountain Laboratories, a uh, division of the NIH and also University of Colorado. And we have, uh, let us see here, uh, we have first author is Kim Hasenkrug, and the last author is Heinz Feldman, and of course, um, many other people in between. So, uh, non human primates, rhesus macaques, um, well, the whole point of this paper is what's the role of T cells? <laughs> yeah, and I would say in the, in the original paper, we have, in the paper we just did, yeah, we have correlative data. That's okay? right. Okay. You immunize humans and you, observe. Uh, and you look and That's see right. what sort of cells they make. You don't have any real experimental data to say what those cells are doing. Right. Okay. So this is an attempt uh, to, in an animal model, because you can't do these experiments in human, in humans, ask the question, okay, well, what role do those uh, different cell types actually play? And the, the, uh, the approach is to use the uh, experimental model to look at either T cells or B cells or uh, animals that have uh, are depleted in one or the other or both, okay, to see how they respond to an infection. Right. And of course, the caveat is that it's an animal model. Right. Yeah. It's not and the, the reason to do this is um, in addition to curiosity and TWIV harping on everybody about look at the T cells, um, which I'm sure was a major motivator for the researchers. <laughs> of course. Here. Um, there, there's also the issue that in clinical infections, there's often a decline in T cells in mm -hmm. people who are developing severe COVID. And the question is, is that feeding this severe disease? Yes. Is and, that causative or correlative? That, that's right. that's true. And also, how important are T cells in recovery right. from infection? Right. right. And, and we should also remember that the previous study was a vaccine study. Yes. And this is an yes. infection study. Yep. Yes. So oftentimes, with you know, the idea with the vaccine is you want to have the same type of um, immune response that is protective against infection. But just because something is made following infection doesn't mean a different immune response couldn't be protective. That's right. I don't know if I'm explaining that well. No, that but makes sense. There, yeah, there, there's, absolutely. A, there's this difference there that the previous study was telling us, what does the vaccine make yes. and correlating with whether or not that was effective. And now this is saying what protects you when you're actually infected. Right. And so- Or what protects monkeys when they're actually infected. Yes, exactly. What protects monkeys, monkeys when you're- So a lot of caveats, but I find- it's completely inappropriate for certain people to say this this paper, this MBio paper, negates the T cell narrative that has been spun by many. And I think that's just wrong. That's wrong. Yeah. Just wrong. And you know who you are, cardiologist. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the people who published the paper didn't say that. So why should he say that? Um, so right, because he has a narrative he wants to push. He has a narrative. He has yes. a narrative. Indeed. He wants a lot of attention. This is called okay. this is called cherry picking. Yeah, well, <laughs> he wants people to follow him and say, this guy is brilliant. He makes observations that no one else do, blah, blah, blah. And people should just say, listen, where do you want to get your information from? A cardiologist or an immunologist or a virologist? If okay. it's about viruses. About viruses, If you've viruses, got heart trouble, yes. go see the cardiologist. For sure, for sure. Don't ask us. Can't but one, one should, well, never mind. Anyway, the rhesus yes. macaques that are known to be susceptible to infection, but they they don't get very sick. They come become mildly or moderately ill. They do not develop this acute respiratory distress that some people do. 
See, the monkeys were smart enough to get the vaccine already. <laughs> no, no, that's not the case. Um, so, you know, before we start, you can argue that this is, you know, on an evolutionary scale, this is a very close species to us, right? However, it doesn't mean that what you observe is necessarily com directly applicable. I mean, and, and close is a relative term. I mean, there's a lot of evolution in between there. They're not our closest living primate they're relatives. Not. No, they're, they're not. not. They're quite, no, they're, they're close. They're close. They're, they are close. Um, I remember Peter Palazzi told me years ago, you take a non-human primate and you spray influenza virus in the nose, they don't get infected. You have to put it into the trachea to get them infected. So it's not like they're a good model. Right. So you have to be very careful. But you can, this is still an experiment worth doing because you can do things in this model that you can't do in humans, like deplete the T cells and see what happens, which is what they're going to do. Yeah. And there are very few places that can do this. Right. Yeah. Right. Monkeys are expensive. Monkeys are expensive. They are to extremely work expensive. We have, we have not only that, but you're talking about a probably a, a, a large or what is this large animal or modest size animal BSL three facility. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Rich, you remember when we visited uh, Galveston? They had a non-human primate. Uh, for, yep. I think it was the BSL four even. Right. Yep. Um, well, and it um, in Boston at the Needle they had they yep. were setting up their BSL four. Yeah. yeah monkey facility, which that's a big deal. All right. So these uh, animals- Nobody likes doing animal experiments. No, I don't There's even, just some information you can only I get don't, this way. Yeah, and I do, I just came back from the mouse house bleeding mice, right? I don't really like to do it because I think they're cool, right? They're yeah. cool animals. I don't even like to kill spiders, folks, but, <laughs> but it has to be done. You need the experimental data. I understand. So you try and distance yourself. Um, all right. So, I mean, I'm looking at the cage and the mice are just running around and around and around and digging, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, oh my gosh. Bored, they're bored stiff. <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea what they're thinking. I have no idea. Well, they're certainly not like wild mice, that's for sure. Well, they're very slow. Yeah, that's for sure. Okay. So they take these uh, animals and they do, they do, they can do infections, but they can do it with and without depleting uh, CD4 cells. Uh, and what CD8 and then both, I don't mm -hmm. remember, yep. uh, which you can do, um, and then infect them. So they, what, what is the, um, okay. So they inoculate them at day zero with the original isolate, the Washington isolate. They let them rest for six weeks, watch videos, I guess. Uh, and then they challenge them a second, uh, a second time. So first infection, they rest. They're, they're not going to get very sick. So they all survive. And then you challenge them a second time and they have uh, separate groups with either no depletion CD4, CD4 plus eight. Is there a CD8 alone? I guess so, right? Yeah, there's yeah. a CD8 alone. Uh, and then they measure lymphocyte responses in the animals and mm -hmm. then they measure, um, responses to the second infection, right? And so for the most part, the depletion worked, although not in every animal. It's quite interesting, right? Uh, so talk for a minute. Let's talk for a minute about how they do the depletion. Okay. They're uh, given antibodies yes. to either of those cells and the antibodies uh, uh, in effect deplete the cells. Can, can you elaborate on that, Brian? Um, so um, we think that a lot of that is probably NK mediated um, NK cells, um, seeing those mm. antigen antibody coated uh, CD4s or CD8s um, and depleting it can be through a few things, but that's sort of the one that I've seen people talk about is NK depletion. Mm. Um, but this is something that's been done in um, sort of non-human primate virology studies a lot. So the, the, primate uh, immunology studies a lot. It's similar to giving a cancer patient an antibody to B cells to to reduce their uh, their B cells that have proliferated, right? Yep, exactly. Yeah. And in my mind throughout this uh, is the uh, question constantly of how efficient was the depletion and how efficient does it need to be? Right. So Can you knock out 90% of a T or B cell population and still be okay? Right. Um, and so it kind of depends on what you mean by be okay. Um, <laughs> the monkeys are still hanging out. Um, my, my PhD advisor usually talked about them hanging out, eating bananas, not watching videos. Um, <laughs> so, um, they're hanging out doing whatever you, your 
thing is, um, and so in that way, yes, you're okay. Um, here we're looking to see whether you're okay with viruses. And in right. figure one, they do show um, their data on the depletion uh, efficacy. Um, and so you can see that with the the CD4 depletion, the CD4s are pretty well gone. Yeah, they say over ninety um, percent. Yeah. Yeah, the, the CD4s are pretty well gone. It looks like the CD8s do come back a bit. Yeah. Um, after about uh, twenty eight days, and it looks like in the double knockouts, the CD4s aren't gone nearly as well. Yeah, I didn't understand that. Yeah, it, Does that it make looks any like, sense to you? Um. I think I'd have to go very deeply into the methods. They don't actually uh, talk about it at all, right? Yeah, but but it really doesn't look like the, I mean, the CD8s are pretty similar to CD8 alone depleted, but the CD4s are just not really gone in those double depleted. So, so let's go through the results. So first of all, in normal animals infected, but not depleted, they say they actually show a transient decrease in lymphocytes. Uh, well, all three, CD4, CD8, and B cells. And they think maybe that's because during infection, they're going to the lymphoid tissues, right, to do their thing. And then right, they come out, measuring of, blood. out of yeah. circulation. Yeah, they come right, out of circulation, blood. right. And um, so it, presumably if you measured from lymph nodes, but then that's that's harder to do. Right, and you and that would be, a, you know, another question here is whether you've actually depleted the cells in the lymph node. Yeah. Um, here we see depletion in the blood. blood. And then in the CD4 depleted animal, that's where Brianne said it's over 90% in all but one animal. So one animal, 78%. Animals are different, right? Just well, like, and the numbers here are small. It's like three monkeys per yeah, group. Yeah, sure. Didn't duplicate. Right. It's, I think it totaled up to about 12 monkeys. Oh, yes. And that's because- Probably, it's Which was a great film, by the way. It's very it expensive. <laughs> it's very expensive. It's very expensive. What's, what's very, missing, very expensive and difficult. What's missing in this study is a control for mm. the, the missing T cells. You know, if you had an animal that's below a certain level, they should respond in a certain way so they don't have that group. So you mean they only, like they only deal with the infections, right? You see what I mean? In other words, there's just got to be a gold standard for when you get below a certain level of T CD4 or CD8 cells, then you can't do something. So, so here they have basically um, the full amount or none. And you're saying mm. you would want gradations in between? Not gradations. I would just want another control group to make sure that you actually did deplete those oh, cells. Oh, you'd want some level. kind of a test that, that yes. shows a difference. Like you, yes. if you deplete CD8s, we know that the monkeys correct, have correct. this problem. Oh, exactly Therefore, right. we demonstrate exactly right. that this group has Alan, this problem. Spot on. All okay. they have is the, the counting of cells, right? By flow cytometry. Yeah, yeah. That's, right. that's, that's yeah. the old ready that's, control. That's another dozen <laughs> monkeys, which we're not. I know. No, no, that's yeah. right. That's right. That's I mean, right. they're like 30 grand each plus care, you know, it's expensive. Yeah, I, yeah. I remember when I was in Australia on my- You got to fund their 401k plans. It's, they yeah. were, now, now, wait a minute. They were doing research on malaria, of course, not, not, C, not this infection, but they said, we're going to try it first in monkeys. And if it works, then we'll try it in people. <laughs> so the oh, CD no, no, no. It, was, it was the other way. It was exactly the other way. We're going to try it in people first. If it if it works in people, then we're going to try it in monkeys because monkeys were too expensive. Wow. That was All right, Australian look, so CD4 depletion. You deplete CD4 is over 90%, then you infect them, and they uh, say no increases in CD4s in the next six weeks. All right. In response to infection. And and importantly, CD8s were the same. And so they're not influenced by the CD4 depletion, right? Because you can imagine that they might be. Right. All right. So then the CD8 depleted animals, 99% um, effective in all animals, over 99% effective in all the animals, and no expansion in the blood for the first two weeks after infection, uh, slight rebound, um, but no significant CD8 response to the first or second infection. But all but one animal had B cell expansions that were really good in response to both uh, infection. So the CD4s and the CD8s are not really coming up after infection, but the, but the B cells are. And then they have the double depleted CD4, CD8. Um, it, and as Rich said, it didn't work well for CD4. Um, and in these animals, the... Um, Four of the animals showed rapid CD4 T cell expansion following reinfection. So different from just depleting CD4 alone, right? A little bit puzzling. 
um, CD8 responses did not come back. All right, so that's just showing the depletion. But what about virus loads? All, in, um, all the animals had high loads of uh, RNA by PCR and nasal swabs. Okay, they, they get uh, an upper respiratory tract infection. RNA loads during the first weeks, not much different between all the groups, except that control animals cleared infections by 14 days while the, the T cell depleted took 21 days. In all T-cell depleted groups, the second infection was handled better than the first, as evidenced by lower viral RNA loads and quicker resolution. Um, they say Hence the word anamnestic. <laughs> yes. T-cells were not essential for eventual clearance because they took away the T-cells, right? That's right. the experiment. Right. But, but to me, the important part was that early piece. So you noted that... Um, the T cell depleted animals didn't clear virus as quickly. And there was a difference early on. Yes. Um, after infection. And I think that matches up with what we saw in the other paper quite well, where it was sort of the early effector phenotype of the cell that was so critical. Right, right, right. right, right, um, right. And yes. then, you know, other types switched. And so to me, this says, yeah, so it it's this very early time point where the effector T cells are critical. Yeah, right. And there is a difference. Exactly. There's a, a, you know, measurable difference between the T-cell depleted and the not T-cell depleted monkeys. I mean, right. and the fact that antibody helps them recover is not surprising, right? Right. It doesn't mean no, that T-cells do not play even. a role. You took them away. Right, right. But what if they were present early? They, as we saw in the other paper, they're likely to play a role. And if they're there before antibody, then as we saw... They're likely to play a role. And given that these animals don't develop severe COVID-19, basically ever, right? Yeah, they um, don't. They don't. Right, right. So what are we going to see? Well, we're going to see them clear the infection. All right, we took away their T cells. Will they still clear the infection? Well, just later on. good for them. <laughs> right, right. You know, if you really wanted to make that argument, you'd also need to have a group where you depleted the B cells. Right. Yes. Aha. Uh -huh. And also I would say you'd have a group where you add back Cells. That's right. That's exactly so right. An addition. An you addition. could take that's, uh, that's T cells correct. from immunized right. or recovered monkeys and here, put here. them in early after infection at a time when there's no antibody and see if they, they help. Roger right? that. Yeah. Roger um, that. So that would be hard, but yes. That would be hard. Especially that's, in mice. That's an experiment bands, yeah. you might be able to do in mice. You, you can do, do it that, in mice. You yeah. could do it in mice, but in monkeys that are outbred, yeah. um, yes. getting T cells that would match to go in would be hard. Yeah. So we could do it in mice. It's been done in mice, but that would really be interesting. Uh, let's see. What else do we have here? Virus loads. All am I just said that. Yes, virus loads yeah. I did. We have clinical signs, which are basically the same in all the groups. Um, it, you know, minor reduced appetite, irregular breathing, ruffled fur, pale appearance, kind of like me on a bad day. Yeah. Um, no difference between the groups. They actually we saw all agreed with that. Wait a minute. Yeah. They, they actually saw some uh, some lesions in one lo lobe, which probably relates to the difficulty in breathing, but yeah. no difference among the uh, control and depleted animals. Um, but they do say that this is interesting. Uh, the scores were significantly lower after reinfection, except in the CD8 depleted group, but there were no statistically dif significant differences. So they say it's significantly lower, but then they say they're not. It's not significantly lower. So yes, I don't get that. Isn't it a little bit of a? There's this comes up a lot in science papers, and it annoys the heck out of me where somebody says there's a difference, but it's not statistically significant. Right. Trending towards, not, no, no yeah, trending, trending towards trending significance. Yeah, trending towards significance. No, trending. you can't. Right. You really just can't do that right. in a scientific paper. That's no. you it's put either on significant or it's not. You put on TikTok. They, they like right. that. You know, I had an aberrant thought about monkeys sitting in cages watching videos, though. <laughs> and that is they, they accidentally insert one of the uh, television series called The Monkeys. Remember The Monkeys? They were a singing group. Oh. And they start to sing. And they start to sing, hey, hey, we're the monkeys. And the monkeys say, those are not monkeys. Those are people. They're saying they're the monkeys. How can they possibly be? They're clearly apes. Yeah. <laughs> clearly, yes, they are. But, you know, they die from this infection. We don't give a <laughs> rat's ass about it, so All to right. speak. Antibody responses in controls. They looked at um, RBD 
receptor binding domain antibodies. So they see IB IgM first, which peak at 14 days. Then they see IgG, which lag behind IgM one to two weeks, peak four, four weeks post-infection. On reinfection, IgG goes up quickly, as you would expect. And then they see neutralizing antibody responses in, in line with those IgG, which is kind of what we saw in the, in the previous study, right? The IgM initially is not neutralizing. Yeah, but this confused me. What's that? Because you need CD4 help to make a good IgG antibody response. Yeah, that's what yeah. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, they were talking, <laughs> they talk about that in the discussion, right? Because um, there are CD4 independent uh, antigens, right? Yeah, but they're usually not allowing class switch. Yes. This I don't is, know. I this was, is I was, polysaccharide antigens. Exactly. This is what makes me wonder if whether the depletion was how really depleted were they? As, and, I mean, yeah. well, you can measure the amount my of question, depletion, but that how was much my, That was my question, Rich. If you don't have a marker for depletion yeah. that's functional, then you can say, well, we depleted 99% of the B cells or T cells, right. but it doesn't really matter if that's not below the functional level. Right. So half of the CD4 depleted animals showed delayed or flat IgM, and two also showed flat IgG. We um, put out 99% of the fire. And they say more surprising <laughs> exactly. was that the other four animals developed class-switched IgG, and they all developed virus neutralizing responses How and strong that? memory mm -hmm. responses. Right. So they say it's more surprising, <laughs> and they don't know why that is, yeah. The double the CD8 and CD4-8 depleted antibodies, um, very similar to each other and to those of the controls, no significant effect of eight depletions on antibody responses were observed. So in summary, no major impact of T cell depletions on antibody responses, even though there was no detectable B cell response in the blood of CD4 depleted animals. Hmm. Thus, B memory B cells uh, responses were associated with protection. Okay. Uh, they also looked at some lymph nodes, uh, Brianne. Sections of cervical lymph nodes showed abundant CD4 T cells in in uh, which which animals? There it must be the controls, and they were reduced in the lymphoid follicles from CD4 depleted animals, although not completely gone. So there was uh, an effect on the lymph node. Levels as there, well. There was an effect, but it's not completely gone. That's not completely, not completely, completely gone. gone. It was yes. the uh, almost significant. <laughs> so maybe that's what's doing the class switch. Exactly. Right? Yep, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. That's what's They're doing. They're just working a little harder. That's all. Because the, the blood, the, the ones in the blood, not really important for the class switch. It's the ah, ones in the lymph node. Exactly. There you go. Yeah. To there me, the go. lymph node data was some of the uh, most interesting relative to how well did the depletion work? Because yeah, the yeah, CD8s yeah. are pretty much cleared out. Okay, there's uh, still a little left, but not much. Yeah. Uh, the CD4, mm, not so much. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, CD8s are way down in the depleteds and no difference in the B cells. In um, the, Yeah. Okay. So the lymph nodes were staying, unlike the diminished levels of B cells in the blood, no difference in total B cells was observed in the lymph nodes. So that's why you're getting class switching, right? Right. All right. So um, what's this, what is the conclusion here? They they would like Good to think point. that T cells do not normally play roles in controlling infection in macaques. <laughs> you have to always add that, right? Um, but I think... This doesn't mean that they play no role. It means that if you take them away, <laughs> antibodies can help. But it may be that at certain points in infection or with a variant, as we saw in South Africa, that they can, in fact, play a role, right? Or it shows that the, the normal level of T cells is not required for an adequate response to SARS-CoV-2 infection in That's the right. In That's the presence right. of antibody. In the, yes. Yeah. yeah. And I just, I would like to point out, I mean, uh, especially if any of the authors are listening, it sounds like we're really harshing on this paper. This is really well done. Yeah, it's that's hard. very well done. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a really important study to do. And I'm I'm very glad they did it. I'm glad they did it right. They looked, you know, at the right places with the right assays. Right. They drilled all the way down. They followed it to the conclusion. Right. And these are the results they got. Yeah. Um, so yeah. there's there is kind of a little bit of spin going on with it. You know, it looked kind of significant, but wasn't type of thing. Um,
but the issue here is how do you publish negative results? Right. And this has been a problem in science since forever. If you, because imagine if you did this experiment and it did significantly affect the course of the disease. Mm -hmm. And then you'd have a model for studying these SARS CoV 2, these COVID 19 patients who have this crash in their T cells. You know, that'd be great. So that's why it's really important to do this experiment. If the results you get is that we didn't really see much impact. Mm. Okay, that's interesting still, but it's not as interesting, and I'm sorry. <laughs> but here, no. the, the other problem is that it just shows that you cannot go on Twitter and make broad pl oh gosh, proclamations no, no. about one paper. That's not how science works. No. You have to say, and, well, and these authors, this is, this as is far as I know, did not do that. This is interesting, but yeah. we need to do this. In fact, the authors say, you know, our studies indicate a role for T cells, but a more important role for antibodies. It would be of interest to determine whether T cell immunity in the absence of antibody would be sufficient for protection. And I totally yeah. agree because they haven't shown that here. And that's why science is always a, a moving thing and you can't, the cardiologist, make these <laughs> proclamations, right? right? Right. We can come up with experiments all day long, but experiments in rhesus macaques are incredibly challenging. Yeah. Um, these are the right experiments to have done here. And this is a transparent presentation of the data. Um, yeah. And I think the authors were did a really great job with this. The question is just how others are spinning it. It's, later. it's a solid paper. And their interpretations were, I think, about right. You know, they said, they hey, you very know, conservative, we, very here's conservative. what we see. We're, and the discussion is pretty conservative. That's right. Um, and uh, And it is really unfortunate that some people are trying to push this in a different direction well, than what it shows. Know, science I, also is a self-correcting process. So sure, of course. But the thing is, in a, in a pandemic- but Twitter the, is not a self-correcting When the news process. cycle- no, no, definitely not. <laughs> the news nor, is, cycle, nor is my business journalism, I'm sorry. The news cycle is accelerated. People get scared by yeah. this stuff. And that's right, so that's I right, think it's do. inappropriate. Um, I want to point out that there has been another study where rhesus macaques were depleted of CD8s and then infected. Um, and in that case, all five of the depleted animals showed breakthrough infection, where hmm. only one of the controls did. So there, and they say, this is a difference from our results. Right. And it shows how tough mm -hmm. non-human primate, non-outbred, non-inbred, non-human primate experiments are. Um, but they so, do, they say they're both supportive of a role. We just don't know uh, how that relates to antibody. So the other thing uh, that comes to mind, uh, I've heard of this. I have not seen the paper. Maybe you guys know, or I, if it's actually published, of cases of humans with a gamma globulinemia. Mm -hmm. uh, they can't make antibody right. who have had SARS-CoV-2 infections and yes. recovered, correct? Yes. So, yeah, and I, so I, that suggests that in humans, a T-cell yes. response by exactly. itself is sufficient to clear the infection. So I, I looked up that. Be. In fact, there are two such papers cited in the Alessandro Sete paper that we did when he was here. It was on TWIV. And so one of them is from Italy where, yes, there was an A-gamma globulinemic patient who um, he got, he was hospitalized and he developed lung, he developed pneumonia. He recovered However, they did treat him with monoclonal antibodies. Ah, right. Right. The authors of that paper say this suggests that, that antibodies, that T cells may play a big role, but we just don't know because it's one patient and we gave him monoclonals. And so I think that maybe we'll see more of those uh, okay. in the future, right? There's, right? there's one more thing I want to point out here. All right, so they say, they say vaccines on the original spike appear left, less protective against new variants, particularly South African. So protective is not enough to say that. You need to say what you're protecting against. And it did, the J&J &J protected against hospitalization and death, 100% right. in South yeah, African right. trial. Okay, right, right, then right, they say right. it is not known whether emerging variants are also evolving to escape T cell responses, but the results suggest there may be less evolutionary pressure. And that's not right because they're basing that on their results, which say the T cells aren't important. But as we have said, I don't think that's correct. And as Seth, they said, the T cell epitopes are not changing. 
And it wouldn't make sense for them to change because if it changes in you, it's not going to help the next person that the virus gets yeah. transmitted to because the HLAs are different than everyone, right? So there's a little, that's not quite correct, that sense. You should fix that, folks. Can you fix it in post? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, it's there. Does anyone, uh, does anyone agree with what I'm saying? Sure. We yeah. all agree does with it. Does it make sense? I, I, okay. Yeah, I think that, that makes sense. Because sometimes when you guys are quiet, I think I'm wrong, okay? <laughs> nope. I, I agree completely with okay. what you're saying. Yeah. Right. I just want to make sure. I'm not an immunologist. I'm just a virologist. Just a plain country <laughs> virologist trying to do the best he could. <laughs> I was born in Patterson, not really a country virologist. Oh, uh, well. Even back then. Even back then, okay. Uh, let us do one round of email and then some picks. How's that? Sounds good. Um, let's see. Let me take this first one because it's short. <laughs> Jason writes, hello, Vincent, Brianne, Rich, Dixon, Kathy, Allen, Daniel, and crew. XKCD has long been one of my favorite comics. He continues to nail it with these. I thought you would appreciate them. And uh, Daniel sends two links. And the first one is uh, two people. The first thing I'm going to do after I get the vaccine, definitely make a bunch of spike proteins and engulf them with dendritic <laughs> cells. Then I'll probably display the antigens to my T cells. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Perfect. Like that. What are you going to do after getting vaccinated? And then we have a graph called Steep in the Curve, <laughs> where we have the original graph was COVID deaths 2020 versus flatten the curve, right? Remember that? Now it's 2021 COVID vaccinations on the Y and steepen the curve. Yes. Yes. It's very good. Yeah, very good. Uh, Dixon. You're muted, Dixon. <clears throat> oh. Yes. Okay. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. June writes. I'm getting these questions frequently on our Utah Healthcare Caucus page. Can you help us understand the process for final approval of the mRNA vaccines or other vaccines for SARS-CoV-2? Will the vaccine get regular FDA approval soon? What are the obstacles? Thanks, June. Any ideas? Time. Time. It's very close to that. I mean, I it's, heard two weeks from now they're going to do it. <clears throat> It's basically time, and Paul Offit talked about this, the difference between the emergency use approval and the regular FDA approval is how long did your trial run? How long did you follow up? Right. And the justification for the EUA was there's never been a vaccine where complications arose more than six weeks after. Here, here. You know, so the trials were long enough to find yep. if there was any serious long-term consequence. That's right. Um, because if there even a long-term effect of a, a side effect of a vaccine is going to show up initially yes. in those first six weeks. That's right. Um, so for the full approval from a regulatory standpoint, they have to wait like a year or something. It's a, it's a long period of follow-up that has to happen. And we're close to that. And now they're going to be able to do the full approval sometime pretty soon, I think, within the next. I thought I read, read two weeks. So, so Daniel okay. yesterday said for Pfizer by Labor Day. But, right, you know, right. Moderna is behind Pfizer because they just started right. later. So, well, they started yes. a little later and they have a four week between the prime and the boost, which gives <laughs> Pfizer a one week advantage in everything. And so they're yeah, probably, yeah. probably. So I watched an interview uh, between uh, an NPR reporter and a um, high level um, sort of a, um, an over uh, story nurse who took care of all the emergencies that came into the hospital. This was in Baton Rouge General Hospital. And this person had not been vaccinated and she had caught SARS-CoV-2 and gotten over it. And she didn't suffer much from it, but she, she was not going to get vaccinated. And the guy says, well, what are you waiting for? And she said that everybody's thinking this happened much too fast. And we're waiting for all of the results to come in before we make up our minds. Now, that information is so misused and so untrue. Mm. I don't. I don't know who's trying to fight that particular issue because that's what some people of apparently normal um, demeanor are saying. That's why they're waiting. And she she was dead serious too. I mean, she didn't uh, have a smirk on her face. She didn't have a political agenda. She says, "I'm just waiting for all the information to come in." Uh, this um, has been a. Uh, this has been a. Uh, you know a. Uh, a How do you address that? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Rich. Oh well, I mean, I mean, this 
uh, I feel like we used to have this discussion in a rational yeah. fashion yeah. much more frequently, but maybe it's just that I haven't done a town hall for a while. The way you address it is uh, actually the way Paul often addressed it. He said when uh, in, in, uh, in response to the question, how did they do it so fast? He said, money money mm -hmm. yes okay it wasn't so fast but, but how does the how does the money impact the thing several ways uh, this is an appropriate time to review this again several ways uh, uh most importantly early very early on in the process uh the investors that is the u.s government made a bet based on preliminary data as right. to which vaccines were going to be effective and in what form, and they started production. And they made multiple bets, right. which is another okay. critical thing. So money sure. down, money down very early on in the process rather yeah, yeah. than waiting so that when something passed the appropriate tests, mm -hmm. uh, they were already producing stuff. And so that cuts out a huge amount of time. The other thing they did is uh, usually you do a phase one trial and then you wait months to raise money and then you do a phase two yeah, trial exactly, and then you raise exactly. wait months to raise money. You do a phase three trial. They happen. were actually able to telescope the trials. Okay. And as soon as they had enough data in a phase one trial to say that that was safe to go ahead with a phase two trial, they started the phase two trial. They right. finished the phase one trial, but they got a head start of the phase two trial. That's Same right. with phase three. So yeah. that saves a lot of time by telescoping right. the That's process. Right. But it, very importantly, it doesn't cut out any of the steps, okay? right. all it, of the it, steps were completed. It only right. cuts out the stop and wait and raise money steps. Yeah. Yes, right. Exactly. You can uh, have it good, cheap or fast, pick two. Yeah. And the other thing that I think is really important is that the bets paid off. The technology, for, oh, importantly, uh, people don't understand that the technology, there's decades of research into the technologies. They say, yes. oh, it's a new technology. Yeah, exactly well, right. That's not true. Right. Okay, the technologies have been uh, researched for uh, upwards of 30 years. Uh, and there have been other types of vaccines using the same technologies uh, in clinical trials in the past. So this was uh, just fortuitously really in a way, though fortuitous right. is not really a good word, but perched, ready to go. Yeah. Okay. Um, the only, the only reason... Yeah, and it worked. It worked. That worked. That's the whole that idea. Okay. And it worked. Another it could, piece of it. Uh, lots of reasons. Yeah. Lots of times, the reason that a vaccine takes so long is to develop is that you go through three or four different vaccine candidates or more, and they fail. These worked, and they the, work really well. Okay, Th three of the ones developed in the U.S. Warp Speed Initiative, unfortunately named, um, <clears throat> did work. They didn't all work. Yeah, there were, yeah. I, I, we had an episode where I, I had gone to a, a conference call where there were like nine companies talking about their mm -hmm. SARS-CoV-2 efforts and eight of them were funded by Warp Speed. They were all at different phases. Uh, and there were some smaller companies there that were sort of long shot bets, but they were fully funded to go ahead with their technology, which again, would have been a fully tested thing. Um, and there were, you know, they didn't all make it. Um, so, right. you know, we, we ended up uh, the most high profile one that didn't make it. Actually, I can think of two, uh, Merck, mm, yes. right? Which early on when that's I heard right. Merck, that's of right. course, Merck is getting involved. I was like, oh yeah, that's totally, they're, they're the ones to do this. And it, it didn't look so great in the, I mean, there was safe and it, it, the phase two results just weren't all that encouraging. And, right. and they said, you know what, we're going to focus on therapeutics because we've, because Pfizer and Moderna had already lapped them at that point and we're, yeah. we're getting the EUA. Um, and the other one is Sanofi, right. which is another company that I said, oh yeah, right. totally. We are, we are so okay with this because they produce most of the world's flu vaccine supply. They're, hugely competent at doing massive production on a short time scale. And they just, it didn't work out so well, you know, and, and that was discovered early in the, in the process. And I think they are proceeding with part of that, maybe for a global vaccine, but um, you know, so the bets didn't all pay off. No. So if you're living in an environment where you are hearing over and over and over and over again that they were developed too fast, okay? Uh, and you're not hearing the, the um, 
the discussion that we just had, it's perfectly reasonable that you would have yes. some uh, some hesitancy. And uh, the fact is that there is a very very good answer uh, to the question as to how they were developed so fast, and it's and it's a very it's a happy answer, okay? Because we did the right thing, That's okay, right. and we did it well. All yeah, right, only, um, but the problem is that that message is much more difficult to circulate uh, than the message that makes you hesitate. So, well, you I, can always, uh, you can always counter that argument by saying, look, it's not FDA approved yet. I'm not going to debt it until it's FDA. Approved. But it is. Well, yeah, of course it, it is for emergency use. Uh, yeah. For Interesting. emergency use. Yeah. But that's still, that argument is still out there. And I well, would be interested to say, we'll see what happens when it's actually approved. I'll bet you the same arguments will be there. I'll yeah, because that, that's just a, well, because that's, that's just one, a scapegoat at this. Point. That's one. That's one of many of the talking points of the Russian troll bots and their allies who yeah, have been that's right, promoting that's right, that's this. Right, that's right. That's right. That's right. Nonsense. Correct. For their own reasons. As long as you can raise a, a reasonable doubt about any yeah. part of this, people will grab onto that and say, yeah. I want to do it. Rich, and that's, in those that's, parts of the country where they hear over and over that it's, you know, not safe, I think they ought to just put on TWIV and play it over and yes. over and over again. <laughs> that's right. That's put right. it on loudspeakers. Yeah, but who's going to listen? You know, that rap, that rap actually took thought and time. Yes. Nobody's going to listen to that. Yeah, I know. You know? Yeah, and as a pick of mine about a month or so ago pointed out, there was a paper on uh, things going viral and the salience of messages. And this whole explanation all makes sense and is all true, but it doesn't make a tweet, right? It doesn't It doesn't give you that, oh, yeah. wow, you know, I get the gist of it instantly right. and I don't have that's to right. spend time figuring anything else out. Actually, that's the value of Paul Offit's yes. response because right. if money. the answer is money, <laughs> yes. everybody People understands that. that. Yeah. Alan, do you think uh, Russian bots are responsible for, for some of the vaccine discord? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's documented. But I thought the top that's, 12 uh, anti-vaxxers were not, were people. No, they're right? not. But they're, that is amplified by that because it's a way to sow discord in the U.S., which is a big part of Putin's agenda. So it's mm. working. Yeah. And the next email addresses the same issue in uh, a different way, okay. and I think it's a great yeah. email. Alan, can you take the next one? I will take that. Jacob writes, in response to all the propaganda about reported deaths on the vaccine adverse event reporting system, that's the CDC system for tracking these, the following simple algebra needs to be commonly understood. 161 million people in the U.S. have been vaccinated for SARS-CoV-2. 12,000 have been reported having died after vaccination on the VAERS adverse events reporting system. The per capita per year uh, cause, cause of death rate in the U.S., 715 per 100,000. That means two people die every day per 100,000, which means on average 161 million times two divided by 100,000 is 3,154 people will happen to die on the day they got their vaccine. <laughs> 6,308 will happen to die within the first two days on average. 15,770 will die within the first five days on average or in any given day period of 161 million of all causes vaccinated or otherwise. Just based on the baseline daily death rate, the number of people who are reported to have died in association with the COVID vaccine shot on VAERS is exactly the number that we should expect if the vaccines killed no one. It's simple mathematics. Thank you, Jacob. Yep. Yes, remember the denominator. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yet on Twitter, did you hear that? 12,000 yeah. people were killed by the vaccine. <laughs> that's exactly right. Well, and that, that's juxtaposed with so-and-so died after getting the vaccine. And yeah. it, it gives you the personal narrative and the whole thing makes a nice tidy. Yes. And people you know. don't understand this yeah. because this is too long for a tweet and we'll never, right. you know, normal. There again, there again, Paul Offit's story is great. He yes. talks about yeah. his wife, the pediatrician, yes. yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> about to vaccinate a uh, child. And right before she's going to uh, insert the needle, the child had, had uh, a, seizure. a seizure. Okay. And she didn't then vaccinate him, dealt with the seizure. The child turned out to have a uh, disorder uh, that mm, resulted ultimately in a bunch of seizures and death. And he says, if she had, if that seizure had happened uh, yeah, yeah. 20 seconds later, that's right. After she had uh, given the inoculation, there is no way on earth you would ever have been able to convince the parents that it wasn't the uh, fault of the vaccine. 
Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the, the other thing that really annoys me to the nth degree is that these are solid figures. 161 million people have been vaccinated. People doubt that. It couldn't possibly have happened because you could die from this thing. Yeah. You know, they, they come up with that kind of a... And we didn't land just, on the moon, Dixon. Right. No, right. we did not do that either. That's right. And... Um, the earth is flat. This, or, yeah, it reminds me. I saw... Right. Uh, and the thing, mafia uh, a assassinated ago, Kennedy. I saw a thing a while ago with <laughs> <laughs> a picture of the solar system with all these planets circulating the sun and the earth was flat. And the caption, the caption <laughs> was something like, this is really embarrassing. Oh, I like that. I, I, I'm going to get that T-shirt. <laughs> Rich, can you take the next one? Tim writes, in her remarks on the CDC update to masking guidance yesterday, CDC Director uh, Rochelle Walensky commented that the viral level from nasal swabs, nasal swabs was indistinguishable between vaccinated and unvaccinated persons. Quote, most new infections in the U.S. continue to be among unvaccinated people, so-called breakthrough infections, which generally cause milder illness can occur in vaccinated people when earlier strains of the virus predominated, infected vaccinated people were found to have low levels of virus and were deemed unlikely to spread the virus much, CDC Director uh, Dr. Rochelle uh, uh, Walensky said. Uh, but with the Delta variant, a mutated and more transmissible version of the virus, the level of virus in infected vaccinated people is, quote, indistinguishable from the level of the virus in the noses and throats of unvaccinated people, Walensky said. The data emerged over the last couple of days from over 100 samples from several states and one other country. It is unpublished and the CDC has not released it, but it is, it is uh, but, quote, it is concerning enough that we feel like we have to act. End quote, Walensky said. Vaccinated people, quote, have the potential to spread the virus to others, she said. In TWIS 783, the discussion of the well-traced Delta outbreak paper, Vincent wondered if part of the elevated RNA detected via PCR testing could be attributable, at least in part, to an increased level of mRNA that facilitated more rapid replication and hence shorter uh, serial interval versus infectious virus. Might more exuberant production of mRNA be contributing to the CDC's unpublished findings? But as mRNA is an important step in synthesis of new virions, this is a distinction without a difference in the course of the infection. I would enjoy listening to an exploration of the role of mRNA levels in SARS-CoV-2 replication and the implications for interpreting PCR test data. To quote Jeremy Irons character from Margin Call, please speak to me as you might to a young child or a golden retriever. It wasn't brains that one. got me here, I'll assure you of that. <laughs> Thanks always for your wonderful, informative, and engaging uh, podcast. Best regards, Tim. I would actually refer Tim to um, the discussion we had yes. on the last episode, yes. okay, that addressed uh, this issue in, uh, was that the MMWR paper from the right. uh, yeah. P-Town epidemic, yeah. which I thought uh, was really extraordinary. And Brianne Brianne's also, out. it's a Singapore paper that yeah. Brianne found. That's ah, really yeah. important. Which, yeah. which is the one that, you know, they met, she mentions here data from the U.S. and one other country. That is the Singapore the paper. Singapore paper. <laughs> right. uh, and if you look at the uh, time, first of all, RNA does not equal virus. Right. And even if it did, we don't know what it means. Okay. Second, uh, you can't just take random points, uh, as we discovered during that discussion. The kinetics of production are really important. It could be that very early there are equivalent amounts of RNA, maybe even equivalent amounts of virus in vaccinated and unvaccinated people. But that's the fire that you have the fire extinguisher for, right? How fast you put it out. Okay. And in the Singapore paper, what we found was that uh, as time went on, uh, there was a more rapid decrease in the signal in vaccinated versus unvaccinated people. And that may be the uh, more important bit of data. Yep. So I, I think that, uh, and by the way, Daniel said he really liked that discussion. Yeah, and he was said, I did too. While he was listening and Brianne was trying to find it, he said he was shouting, Singapore, it's Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Daniel. But um, th that- You got uh, to it. <laughs> so I, I just think that um, for the CDC to make this decision based on a single PCR point, 
and not even looking at infection. I just think, you know, for her to say that the that it's trans more transmissible, I just think this is not right. All right. They okay, so this the CDC is in a tough spot. They wanted yeah. they want to be cautious without scaring the hell out of everybody. And what happened was an internal presentation to people at the CDC about how to get the message across leaked to the media, which is with unpublished data. This is like the worst thing you could leak when you're trying to have this kind of communication. Um, so, <laughs> and y'all did a very good job of delving into all the nuances of that and, and what it might actually mean. And gosh, we'd really like to actually see these data if we're going to all be talking about them, but you know, they'll get them out when they can get them out. Um, and, you know, okay, so masks, they probably help, they cost nothing. And you're already telling unvaccinated people to mask up if they're indoors. Let's go ahead and tell everybody to mask up if they're indoors until we figure this thing out. But Alan. Yeah, it she, seems to me that it, it, it doesn't, it almost doesn't matter these details about Delta or whatever. We've got, right. we've got two tools yeah. to deal with this whole thing. We got vaccination. Totally. We got masking slash distancing. Okay. Totally. And there's no question whatsoever, but that we're experiencing a new surge. Yes. Okay. So let's apply all the tools. Totally. In particular, vaccination and get the hell out of there. But I you're agree. seeing the new surge only in unvaccinated people. You should add that. Though, of course. Because that's right. very important. Because that's who goes to the hospital. That's extremely and, important. And the critical point that got lost in most of the discussion, you, you all did bring this up and I thank you for it, but the general discussion about the, the Provincetown outbreak is, oh my gosh, they're, they're mostly vaccinated people and they got infected. Okay. How many people died? Nobody. Nobody died. Nobody. Nobody. And you're welcome on behalf of Massachusetts for doing the experiment <laughs> that needed to be done. And and we did it upright. I can't really take credit because I wasn't no, in Provincetown. Not, but but, uh, but, but nice this, was, anyway, Alan. this was <laughs> thorough, right? 60,000 people yeah. descended. And if you've never been to Provincetown, 60, it is not a big place. 60,000 nope. people. 60,000 60, people. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and is on, huge. Right. And I think the latest numbers are maybe 800 wow. came okay. back uh, PCR positive. PCR positive. Okay. That's, yeah. So it's just over 1%. Who the and hell that's paid the people, for that? That's the people who got <laughs> tested, either because their healthcare right. workers being routinely tested or because they had some symptoms. There might be more infections that were asymptomatic. Who cares? Right. Um, and uh, what was it? Five people went to the hospital, four of them were yes. vaccinated. Yes. Uh, 1% um, of the ones who tested positive. Right. And none of them died. Right. And one of the things that occurred to me is if we were to go back in time to 2018 or 2015 or any previous year, this is not a new thing in Provincetown. They've been having a big 4th of July bash for a long time. And I gather it's of similar scope. But if we if we went back and ran around with a bunch of swabs and took samples of all the people who'd been to that party in 2018, totally pre-pandemic, and monitored symptoms afterwards. How many people got respiratory viruses afterwards? Oh my gosh. I'm going to bet it's not zero. No, of course not. Right? right? I mean, you go to a big event where everybody's packed indoors into bars and they're talking right. loudly because when they drink, they can't hear each other. And then you got to talk loudly because the drunks next to you are talking loudly. Um, and, and that's all going on. Respiratory viruses are circulating. And a few days later, you feel crummy for a few days and nobody cares. Right. Yep. And and a few people who maybe had complicated health issues ended up in the hospital for it. And oh, man, I shouldn't have partied so hard. And now they're fine. Um, that's that's your post vaccine world. That's right. By, by the, what, go ahead. Go ahead. Guess what, gang? What? Today, the 2021 Sturgis motorcycle rally starts. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> now they're gonna, now S South Dakota is going to do the experiment with an unvaccinated group. Yeah. We'll see how that goes. Do you think they'll allow them to take the swabs? <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, you're uh, going to do what? <laughs> they will before they put them on the ventilators. On that Friday episode, I my one of my picks was an article in Medium by Ingu Yun, right, an MD who wrote a wonderful analysis. You guys remember that? Yes. 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 
So he wrote to me yes. today. He said, I just, he wrote to me, the author wrote, he said, I want to give you a big thanks for your support and validation of my analysis of the Provincetown COVID outbreak. A friend sent me the link to your podcast last night. I was totally shocked and amazed to be featured on Twitter. How about that? How about that? I've never posted anything like that before. I'm publicity shy and not on social media for a reason. I'm not an expert on any of this. Yes, I have an MD, but I'm a retired ophthalmologist. And my general medical knowledge is limited to what I've retained from 40 years ago, which isn't much. So I was terrified <laughs> to publish the article, wondering if I might be missing something and preparing myself for it to be shot down. And yet it seemed correct to me and important enough that I could overcome my fear to post it. Your praise of the article means everything to me. Excellent. How cool is that? It's too, sad, too bad that all ophthalmologists uh, are not. Right. Um, not so clear sight. That's a good point. Well, yeah, that's what Rich, I just they picked. Don't all, they I just they picked on a cardiologist. The for <laughs> they don't see the same way. <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> well, I just want to make one more comment about this before we do the last email. And that is for Rachel Wilensky to say the level of virus in infected people is indistinguishable from the level of virus in the noses and throats of unvaccinated people is just wrong. She's an HIV person. Why doesn't she understand that? <laughs> It's the data do not say that, right? It's PCR. It's one PCR point, And as the Singapore paper says, it doesn't matter. I'm, so I'm very disappointed in that spin on it. That's all I want to say. And we take one more from Brianne. Can you take uh, Justin's, please? Sure. Justin writes, just sharing what I woke up to today. Since I work for the US EPA, I can't really forward you the emails. And commiserating. It's 22 degrees Celsius and sunny in Lakewood, Colorado. At this point, I... Blame willingly unvaccinated people. Here, here. We are hoping there is a federal mandate for weekly testing and masks for unvaccinated, just to make things harder on them for doing the wrong thing. <laughs> we should try new angles to the effect of like, if we can't get over this pandemic, it is going to tank the economy. And countries that do get the vaccination rate higher will have less sick people and outcompete us. Maybe I, their I hate China side will kick in when you bring up their wallets. For example, will the Delta variant wreck the recovery? Um, and he gives a link. Thanks for letting me rant and rave. As just a chemist, I'm really fortunate to have TWIV uh, from Justin. Just a chemist. Just a chemist. <laughs> um, so you could make a mask mandate, but the states would reverse it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and only you can do it for federal employees, I guess, in different right. states. Yeah which I think has been done, correct? Or is that a vaccine mandate? It's a vaccine mandate. But as you know, some states just say you can't make a mask mandate. I just don't understand. We've said this a million times, but you got to hear it again. What are you thinking? Yeah, the governor of Maryland was on the NPR show last night, and that very question came up. And he's not going to make a general over an enormous state, uh, statement on this. He's not going to require them to wear masks to go back to school. But the schools have a right to say, you can't come back to our school unless you've got a mask. And he's not going to um, oppose that, whereas the hmm. uh, governor of Florida is going to oppose that. So you have these crazy, crazy people. I, I, Vincent, I totally agree with you. I, you just throw up your hands and you know, now what are you going to do? You, you can't keep uh, offering them logical explanations as to why they should be doing these things if they're unwilling to accept logic. So the Chinese have a wonderful expression for this one. They said, you cannot argue with a tiger. <laughs> and that's what they'll say well, to these There's people. also the one which is you can't talk logic with someone who's position is illogical to begin with. Right. Right? That's right. You can't that's reason exactly someone out of a right. position they didn't reason themselves that's into. Right. Yeah. That's right. That's it. The point is that they may, they may that. agree with you, but they've got other reasons for disagreeing yes. with you. Well, of course. They have agendas and uh, it's politically driven and economically driven. Exactly. At this it's point, I think the Santis is funded by the virus. That just... <laughs> Something like that. that it sense. must be. And, and the cruise ship industry. Yes. <laughs> well, that he is funded by. That's exactly. Fact. Exactly. Let's do some picks. Yes. Dixon, what do you have for us? Oh, I have a wonderful um, update on a uh, an invention that was started by Elon Musk 
um, and his scientists, of course. He didn't invent this himself. And it's an, an old idea that dates back to the uh, maybe 1910s, 1920s, to have super fast travel. And this is the update on that, the Virgin version of Hyperloop, which is a a rail system which does a maglev train in a reduced vacuum or a, yeah, a partial vacuum so that it cuts down on the resistance of this train traveling in a tube from one place to the next. And the advance on this technology has been amazing. And this is the first um, effort to show how this would work with people inside these cars. They actually had passengers that went over to, uh, I think it was 110 miles an hour or something like this, in a very short length of uh, Hyperloop track to show that the concept actually works. Mm. And the video on this is exceptional. <laughs> you should watch this video. It's quite wonderful. And this, this will happen probably over the next 20 years. And the prediction is that it will eliminate domestic air flights because they will, this travels faster than a commercial jet. It travels over 700 miles an hour. Over the so route that you've built. Yes. Over the rules that you build. And you, if you go online, that's going to be the. Out, that's going to be yeah. the. No, no, no. Well, you, well, it's like Tesla charging stations right now. It's a little bit tough. This but is a little that. taller barrier. But no, I agree with that. It's but a if, lovely idea. I personally, I would I love to love this idea. I love like this idea. Shot out of a rail gun. This is like <laughs> absolute blast. As long as you stop. <laughs> yeah. As long as they've worked out the braking. They have. They've, yeah. they've actually done all of that. So if you go online now and, and type out Hyperloop uh, domestic routes, and go into Google Images. There are maps all over the place. Of course, there are making their maps. Maps are cheap. Yeah, so do this, do this, don't do this. Don't <laughs> You're do so that. cynical, so, Alan. You're so cynical. <laughs> you, well, no, that's well, okay. That's okay. So okay. here in the Springfield area, we're we're really really excited because Amtrak Joe is in the White House, and we might finally get really sure. good rail service that yeah, connects us properly to the Northeast Corridor. You might. And that's you just might. rails. That's just existing that's right. technology. Oh, that's right. Like mm. putting spikes in wood. Um, <laughs> I, I would love <laughs> to have this thing set up, this it's hyperloop funny. set up that I could get onto in Springfield and and show up at the incubator at the Twiv Studios. Mm -hmm. That's right. You know, That's twenty right. minutes later, that'd be awesome. Oh, that'd be great. Um, that'd be great. You could come down well, for the every first Twiv. One that Alan. I think you're going to see will probably be. Well, let me just finish this because the first one you'll see is I think between Dubai and Abu Dhabi because that's where the money is. That's where the money is. And that's it. once that works, everybody else will want one and they'll get one. That's what's going to happen. So how, f how fast would Austin to New York be? Well, you can you can actually uh, calculate that. Uh, this train travels 700 miles an hour. All right. Yeah, it's like a flight, a, right? Isn't that like it's a flight? It's faster. Well, it's much faster than a flight. Right, it's actually see. above the sound. Austin you know to New York City miles. Let's see what this is. Because we're going to get rich out for every episode, man. That's right. That's right. So... <laughs> So here's why it's it's faster than flight because you don't have to go to an airport. Okay, seventeen hundred miles. Station, sixteen hundred miles. Seventeen. How fast does this thing go? Seven fifty. Seven fifty. So that's uh, two and a half hours. Rich, you willing to do it? Absolutely. Yeah, not every not every over. week, but now and then, I could come. Yeah. And, I could come there. We could go to lunch. Sure. Good. And then you could get back for dinner. You could be back for some dinner. barbecue. That place, the laundromat <laughs> we went to, I really liked that. That was okay, really. Okay, we're going back. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is a great idea, but Alan is right. To have these things crisscrossed all over the U.S., forget it. It's going to make a mess. You know, they said the same thing about flight. We hate mass transit in this country. We do. <laughs> Except mass transit is flight, now flight, flight is different. Flight is in a special, special <laughs> that's category. Still, that's still I love mass, mass transit. transit but I, I love I, mass transit. I'm in the minority. Yeah, but you I do live too. in mass. No, I you do. live in mass. We live in New Jersey. This is different. <laughs> I have become a commuter. I stopped driving and I really like taking the train. Good for you. Because I've got to the point where driving was just too much. And, you know, there's some issues. But the, the good point right now, post-COVID, the trains are empty. Right. <laughs> right. That's right. And the subways are at, but They're all working out of home. But maybe That's Dixon right. for Maine, like Northeast Corridor, one uh, tube yeah, from yeah, Boston yeah, to Washington, yeah. right? That would be that's cool. That's correct. And then have another one going out to Springfield for Allen. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's actually, we're, we're not far off the off the Boswash Corridor. You could actually route an additional line through Hartford and us and then out to Boston. You're going right. to see one from New York to Albany. I can guarantee that. And that'll be 20 minutes or something. Maybe. 
They, it'd cool. be even less. Uh, I think it's great. I hope it happens, Dixon. I really do. Yeah, that'd be, well, it would be great. This this is a prelude to the, the fact that it's happening. Yeah. Brian, what okay. do you have for us? Um, so I have another site that I use in classes. Um, I'm sure this has probably been picked sometime in the vast history of TWIV, though I was having trouble finding it, um, called BioNumbers, um, which basically has the uh, quantitative information about most anything you'd like to know about with the cell. Um, the one that I uh, sometimes will pull up, for example, is under cellular building blocks. They'll have things like, which is bigger, the mRNA or the protein that codes for it. <laughs> um, and you can click on that and it will actually kind of show you the relative sizes cool. of a, an mRNA um, and a protein. Um, they also have a new section of uh, SARS-CoV-2 by the numbers. Uh, and it's just a lot of really interesting information. Um, and knowing this stuff and being able to look this stuff up and trying to figure out some aspects of biology is pretty useful. That's very cool. This is great. If you go to the viruses site, they got a picture of T7. Nice. That makes me real happy. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. All Excellent. those numbers you always wish you had, except very cool. it's very slow loading for me. I don't know why. Oh, mine's yeah, loading okay. Mine's okay. I mean, this there's this um, PDF link. Is that what the I should- PDF is for the SARS-CoV-2. Oh, right. that's SARS-CoV-2. Sorry, yes. Yeah. Quantitative miscellany. How many cells are there in an organism? That's good. What does it say? It's still loading. Oh. <laughs> How many cells are in a nasopharyngeal swab? I learned that a few weeks ago. Yeah, what was it? 35,000? Something yeah, like roughly. that. It was a yeah. lot. Here, uh, I, I have it. It loaded for me, Rich. Oh, um, what kind of organism would you like? Right. I'd like a human organism. Uh, 3.7 um, plus or minus 0.8 times 10 to the 13th. How can Madison... I so mean, 30 trillion. How yeah. can Drew University's internet be better than Columbia's? Well, I can tell you. There you, you. go. I can tell <laughs> you. How can, how can me on the unfashionable side of Massachusetts have better internet than you in New York City? We have supposedly gigabit, but it doesn't matter if... Well, we wired it through the Hyperloop. That's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, wow, this is cool. Thank you, Brianne. I'll, I'll put that in my somewhere to keep going to it. That's cool. It's a really useful uh, thing to be able to look stuff up on. Definitely. Rich, what do you have for us? This is real simple. This is just a letter to the editor from the uh, our local paper, the Austin American Statesman. That caught my attention uh, as being a sort of a similar sort of uh, metaphor or analogy as the fire extinguisher being your immune system, okay? And this is in response to all of the back and forth and criticism about CDC changing its mind, okay? Which drives me nuts. Uh, and I'll just read it. Uh, it's from a uh, resident of Austin named Dennis McFadden. And he says, advice will evolve as the situation, as the COVID situation changes. People need to understand that when a government agency changes its recommendation on vaccinations, masks, and social distancing, it is because the knowledge about the situation has changed. New knowledge has emerged about the rates of contagion, who's being infected, where the hotspots are, and so on. People understand when a weather prediction or a traffic report changes because of new developments and new knowledge. You would not base your picnic or driving behavior today on a weather prediction or a traffic report from last month. That's the bottom line. I love that. That's good. Why would you want to continue to use knowledge about vaccination, masking, and social distancing that is similarly out of date? Science, weather, and traffic all change rapidly with time. COVID-19 is a deadly global virus that will be with us for years. Everybody needs to use the most up-to-date knowledge when battling it. Good on you, Dennis. Well put, Dennis. <laughs> yep. And if you read through the other letters that the link gives you, you can see where um, how Austin rolls. Okay. <laughs> yes, you bet. I'll, I'll leave that to you. Gutless Greg, I like the next letter. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing applies for children and their parents. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to use that analogy. Uh, uh, you know, when people bring up, ah, oh, they're changing their mind. Yeah, right. They do. So it rained last week. Mm -hmm. Are you going to cancel your activities for the day? Exactly. <laughs> Very good. Alan, what do you have for us? I have a pick from uh, one of my many geeky hobbies. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I mentioned this, but one thing I like to do occasionally is go geocaching. Mm. And this is an incredibly nerdy thing. You take a GPS or these days your phone and you go find hidden treasure in the woods. And by hidden treasure, I mean a little Tupperware box with some stuff in it that people <laughs> left and a, and a log that you you 
put your name in and then you log it on the website. Uh, it's just, you know, it's, it's like the predecessor of Pokemon go or something. It's an excuse to get outside and, and do something nerdy. Um, given that background, it should come as no surprise at all that a lot of the people at NASA are geocachers mm. and, um, they, some of them managed to sneak an Easter egg, a little, little fun thing onto the Mars perseverance Rover. <laughs> It is a geocaching game piece. They, they gave it a code and, and it showed up in one of the early shots of a test target that was sent back to Earth, hmm. the, the geocaching code on it. So if you go and you find it, you could and, and visit it in person at some point, you could log that as a as a find. Um, now, to honor that the people who run the geocaching activity have produced this series of collectibles and you can get a little uh, sort of challenge coin thing that you could leave in a local geocache for other people to find um, and some other things. And so I've just linked to the page of, of Perseverance Rover geocaching swag that you can pick up. Yeah, that's funny. Dixon. Actually, apparently, this is not the first uh, uh uh, outside of Earth geocache no, activity. No, it is not. There's a geocache on the space station. <laughs> really? <laughs> yep. Same reason. We'll, ha we'll have to ask Kate if she... <laughs> if she, if she yeah. got it, logged it. Yeah. My money's on nice. China. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Very cool. Uh, my pick is a uh, NPR article. Apparently, Barbie now is women of science. Um, Mattel's Barbie turns women of science, including COVID vaccine developer, into dolls. So the COVID vaccine developer is Sarah Gilbert, who was working on the Chadox, remember, at the University mm -hmm. of Oxford. And, you know, I thought maybe this is not a good pick because a lot of people don't like dolls, blah, blah, blah. But I think it's cool that she's got a doll made after. I wonder what she thinks about, about yeah, this. No, I, I saw an article from The Guardian with her holding it and doing an interview about it. That's um, cool. and, and, and my the thing that I retweeted about that article was that I wanted one of Kismiki Corbett too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that, so that's what I was looking for. They have, I don't know, they have nurses and doctors, it seems. Mm -hmm. I don't know who else, but they're, would you say they're women of science? They're women of medicine, but but Sarah Gilbert is a woman of science, so yeah. that's fine. But you need more women of science, that's for sure. So well, that's good. They're doing what they can. Well, and, they, and they, they Barbie, can. I mean, this is a this is a culturally freighted thing. Barbie is complex. <laughs> And oh, they have a video of uh, <laughs> I mean, Brian, Sarah Brian Gilbert, can probably yeah. speak to this better than I. But my ex <laughs> my experience in talking to a lot of women over the years that when this subject came up is that women in general, especially American women, have a complex relationship with Barbie. Is that right? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> uh, look, uh, I, all I'll say is I am glad that they are helping little girls think about becoming yes. scientists. Yeah, yeah we're doctors or nurses. Okay. I mean, they're doctors and nurses. That's fine. But I think there are already Dr. Barbie okay. dolls, right? You can, you yeah. can nitpick about that, but it's nice that they're... I can, that they're making yes. an effort. Uh, you know, I always nitpick about things, yes. Alan. It's <laughs> typical. But I keep telling doc, and doctors are doctors. You don't want doctors doing experiments on you, do you? Or maybe you, you certainly do. certainly don't want scientists treating you. <laughs> yes, uh, no, that's for sure. No. Anyway, cool. It's cool. Sarah Gilbert, congratulations. Um, now, the next question is, would you come on to TWIV? Because yeah. now that you're a Barbie doll, maybe you're too famous, but we'll try. I'll send you an email. <laughs> but I tried... The guy over there, what's his name, who works with her? Only if Ken comes with her. <laughs> and he said no a long time ago. But maybe she'll be more reasonable. Uh, we have two listener so, picks. Oh, yes. I was going to say, someone else did ask me in response to that. Um, a friend of mine texted me and asked me whether or not there was going to be a Fauci Ken. It's funny. Oh. He's already got a bobblehead, man. That's what I said, yeah. He doesn't need a doll. He is true. a doll. Uh, we have a two listener pick, Nancy. I thought you all would appreciate this funny little video on vaccines at a party. Thanks for all yeah, you it's, do. It's good. It's very good. This yep. is very good. It's funny. Loved it. And um, Jeff, hi, you all. My first listener pick. Hope you like it. Lessons from AIDS denialism for COVID-19. <laughs> and gives us a uh, New York Times article, How to Survive a Plague. Part two, the resistance to COVID vaccinations is eerily familiar to those who lived through the early days of the AIDS crisis. 
for sure. Denialism, which continues to this day, you know. Yep. If, uh, HIV does not cause AIDS, according to some people. That's right. Go figure. Um, the uh, uh, the punchline to this particular article mm -hmm. is that the AIDS denialists are all dead. Yes. Yep. <laughs> some of, most of them are, but many still live. And they're a not. Lot of the COVID denialists are already too. The, the, many That's of true. the AIDS denialists are actually they don't, they don't actually have AIDS, right? But there have been many patients, yes, who did said, "I'm not taking drugs because the virus doesn't cause AIDS," and they're dead, right? And I complained about that once in one of my lectures, and someone wrote, "You have no right to tell people what they can or cannot do." And I and I'm okay. You're right. I don't. I'm just saying that, that HIV causes AIDS. That's all. You have you have every right to tell them what they should or shouldn't do, and they have every right to not listen to you. But yeah, it's true. <clears throat> um, vaccinationally yours, Jeff J H B J H H B. Just a human being. That's a good one. It's a good like one. J H B. P.S. Perhaps as a fundraiser, anyone who contributes this month could be placed in a drawing for an invitation to visit the incubator. That's a great idea. I yeah. like that. Huh. Uh, maybe we'll do it. Uh, I mean, it's a good idea. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how to do a drawing, but uh, maybe next next week we'll announce it. I like that because we can have people visit. Yeah, but it's not set up yet, so we have to wait. All right, that's uh, TWIV 791. A Alan, this is Epitope 791. Did Epitope you know? 791, I heard Epitope that, yes. Right. Great. And I know I'm overworking it, yes, but <laughs> subtlety is not my virtue. <laughs> um, you can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. Questions and comments, TWIV at microbe.tv. Please support us. Now we have a place. We need to pay for it. Microbe.tv <laughs> slash contribute. Dixon de Pommier is at trichinella.org, thelivingriver.com. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. This is um, enormously entertaining and educational. Thank you, Dixon. Well, you're part of it, so thank you. Well, no, no, thank you. No, we can go on. We like go back and forth. <laughs> Bri Brianne Barker's at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. Love talking about T cells. Yes. Or any immunology, really. Yeah. Right. right. <laughs> but you don't like. Or science, or, you know. <laughs> so viruses work too? But yeah, I was going to say, or viruses, science, yeah, all, okay. all those things I'm pretty excited about. Good deal. Rich Good deal. Condit is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently at Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Fair enough. Always a good time. Alan Dove is at alandove.com. Alan Dove on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>